I call the virtual meeting to order. It is 7.03 p.m. I am in conference room C of the Fisher Administration Building. Board members are participating remotely via the video conferencing platform Zoom. The purpose of this meeting is to adjourn, wait, long page. I'm gonna begin again. A virtual meeting of the Wauwatosa School Board will be held on Monday, May 4th, 2020 at 7 p.m. in Conference Room C of the Fisher Administration Building. I call this meeting of the Wauwatosa School Board to order. It is 7.03 p.m. on Monday, May 4th. I am in Conference Room C of the Fisher Administration Building, 12121 West North Avenue with other board members participating remotely via the video conferencing platform Zoom due to active health and safety concerns associated with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic health emergency. Ms. Newman, please call the roll. Mr. Doman? Here. Ms. Fraley? Here. Mr. Meyer? Here. Ms. Mufeld? Mr. Phillips? Here. Mr. Rollin? Here. Dr. Jessup Anger? Here. We begin with a uh, non-agenda public comment on non-agenda, public comment on non-agenda items. Members of the Wauwatosa School Board value the input of students, parents, staff members, and community members. The board's regularly scheduled meetings provide an opportunity for opinions and concerns to be expressed publicly. The board values all comments and will respectfully consider this input in decision-making. The board requests that individuals limit their comment on each item to three minutes. Following any comment, an individual board member may respond to the issue raised. However, it is not the intent of public comment portion of the agenda for agenda items that are to, to co publicly comment. It is not the intent of the public comment portion of the agenda for the board to enter into a debate with members of the community. Because non-agenda items are not publicly posted in advance, no action will be taken on public comment this evening. Is there any public comment? Jimmy, do we have anybody? We have no, no attendees with hands raised. No. Okay. Seeing as there's no public comment, we will move into our agenda item, first agenda item of the evening, the superintendent report. Dr. Earl? Thank you. I will um, give, give a brief update of a, a couple of things going on in the district at this point in time. Um, one information was sent out recently regarding graduation for the um, seniors class of 2020. Um, I know there was some concern about the fact that we're doing a video. I'm actually kind of excited about the whole video process. I think it'll be a, a nice add on to what I hope is going to be a graduation ceremony in July. So I think the important message I want to get out is that we're still planning to have graduation in July. This is, um, but under current circumstances, that, that wouldn't be able to happen. We believe and I'm hopeful that in July, I shouldn't say I believe, but I'm hopeful in July that we're able to do some sort of graduation ceremony for, for our seniors. But video is being done and we'll have it released on the website at the time so that our uh, families can do some sort of a, a celebration even in June, early June, June 7th, I believe is the date. So we're gonna keep moving on that. Information went out about summer school. Um, again, we're developing a summer school based on a lot of recommendations, but based on current um, standards of where we're at. So it's virtual right now. I'm hopeful that when July 1st comes around, there's some change or some possibilities to do some, some, uh, some things different than the way we're currently do, doing them virtually. So whether it's small group face-to-face -face, or there's something we can do with childcare and the adventure club with the rec department, um, it still goes back to my point of we're making a lot of decisions based on information right now. Things keep changing very often. Um, so certainly don't want to close the door on anything and we can't open doors that, that aren't um, available to be opened right now. But with summer school, we want to make sure that 
that is a possibility, whether it's a second session or some time after July, July 1st. Um, school perception survey is coming for families. The staff is going on currently right now. So we're continuing with that process. We ask that people participate, give their input on um, their perceptions of the Wauwatosa School District and a lot of different components within that, that survey. So the, the planning for fall, um, what we're starting to see a lot of is planning from what's going on in other countries when they've restarted their education and what that looks like. Um, we're gonna continue with our pandemic group as well as other planning groups to prepare for a lot of different scenarios in the fall. Um, hopefully that decision will not be made real quickly, but that we can take our, our time and get a good plan in place for a lot of different possibilities and um, have the best decision made for moving into next fall. Again, that's a number of months off, but I think it's important that you know that we are continuing to plan and look at a lot of different uh, information that's out there about best practices um, that are just very recent best practice of restarting and a lot of information regarding um, school in the fall. Educator Appreciation Week is this week, so thank you to all the educators that are on the meeting and everybody else that might be listening at some point in time. Um, I've said that over and over about the people in the Wauwatosa School District and especially in the past six weeks. It's pretty amazing what they've done and it's unfortunate that um, hopefully our words mean something of appreciation and, and we let people know that we really do and um, we're really trying to support our staff as they try to work through this um, tough times and different times in, in educating our, our students and they've been amazing. They've, I think they've just been incredible and that comes from a lot of feedback from parents, um, a lot of feedback from students and just my general feeling as well and, and feedback from our principals and other administrators. So a big thank you. Um, a lot of our principals were out putting signs in yards and I will continue this week trying to get all of our employees we ran a little short. I didn't realize we had as many people as uh, working as we do. We're over 800, so um, we got a quick order in for more signs, and some of them came today, and more will be coming tomorrow and, and Wednesday. So um, we want people to feel proud of having that sign in their yard. So we'll go out and stick them in there. Um, and also we're working on getting information together to assess our effectiveness of how we're doing. So we've been at this a while and I think there's stages as you go through, we really want to make some kind of determination, very um, trying to keep it simple and look at, are we getting better as we're going along? Are we having more impact on, on students? I don't want to get into some major metrics of, of effectiveness which I think we need to do at some point, but right now just trying to see, are we, are we engaging the students and are we getting better with it? Are we getting more, um, more or are we having more students fall off? I think just trying to get a good sense of how things are going. I know we had some final results, results from student surveys and I think I just saw that earlier today and it looks like that'll be some information we'll be able to use to, um, certainly the numbers were off the charts in some areas where our kids really felt good about the impact their teachers, uh, the communication with their teachers, their ability to contact teachers. So they are available, that's for sure. Um, but there's some other areas and we can look at and see if we can get better in, in doing that soon. So those are just some updates of some things going on right now. Any questions from the board for Dr. Ertl? I have one. Um, can you hear me? Good. I can hear you. Okay. Um, so there's been some rumors going around that the seniors might be able to end earlier, like not do online schooling anymore. Is that a possibility at all or no? Because I know MPS schools have stopped the virtual learning and then some schools in Chicago have. Yeah, at this point, it's not. We want to make sure it goes up um, as far as we can and as best we can. I know there's, I, I don't know. I mean, what is, I'm not sure what senioritis means anymore in this environment. Um, yeah. So I know it's really challenging in, in so many ways, in particular for our seniors. So we wanna to try to find ways to take care of you guys and make sure that 
um, seniors are feeling good about leaving and we want to make sure that it's not going to, seniors won't go all the way completely to the end. I think there's some other things we're looking at, but um, yeah, we want to, we want to keep going as long as we can with it, as long as it's effective. Other questions from the board? Thank you, Dr. Erdl, and uh, thank you to ever, all the all the staff, the teachers. Um, I'm so proud of your work. Um, the board has been talking about this. Some of you have joined us for meetings over the last few weeks since we've been doing this virtually. Many of you haven't, but um, as a parent in the district, as a board member, I could not be prouder of the work that you're doing. Uh, I, I keep seeing creative uh, changes, adjustments, really thoughtful stuff. Um, so it just, your, your pace of what you've done, uh, your connectedness to students has been really just wonderful to see. The values and the, the, the work has been just outstanding. Any public comment on this item? Jamie, I'm not sure if we have anybody. Oh, we've got, we've got some guests, but uh, none of them have raised their hand. Okay. Okay. Uh, our next item that we have with no questions is the consent agenda. Are there any items on the, on the consent agenda which board members would like to remove for separate discussion and action? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Doman. Uh, Mr. Meyer, are you okay with me using your moving, moving it to, as being a second? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Second. Uh, any board comment or questions on the consent agenda? Seeing none, Ms. Newman, please call the roll. Mr. Doman? Yes. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Rallin? Yes. Dr. Jessup Anger? Yes. Oh, Mrs. Mewfeld? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Ms. Mewfeld. <laughs> Got you. Thank you all very much. We are next going to move into an administrative contract for the Director of Human Resources. Dr. Erdl? Do you want a motion on that before? Uh, we, we, we do. I, the, I am off my virtual game. Uh, Mr. Phillips, can you motion this? Sure. It is recommended that the school board approve the 2019 through 2021 administrative contract of Jennifer Foch as Director of Human Resources effective July 1st, 2020. This is for a 229 per year at an annual salary of $100,000 and I so move. May I have a second? Second. Thank you. Um, Dr. Erdl, can you talk us uh, through this new hire? Sure. Um, so she is coming from the New Berlin School District and as an, is currently an assistant principal. Um, what's really great about her is she's going to have the educational background to work also in the HR field, which is a little bit different um, angle and um, we're excited to, to have her. She's kind of taken that path and said, I want to do HR. She's done some training. She was being mentored by the, the director in New Berlin um, and we're excited to have her join our team. Ida, I don't know if you want to add anything else and I don't know if she's... she's with us or... Yep, um, Jennifer's with us. I, I did... Uh... Yeah, she can probably say a few words to the board as well. Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer. I'm really excited to join the Wauwatosa team. Um, you guys are doing great things and I'm excited to continue the good work going on in the school district. And um, as, as previously stated, I do have administrative experience in school buildings. Um, I was a Latin teacher before that and I've been sort of working the last couple of years to um, beef up my knowledge of HR and 
I decided that this is a new path that I'm definitely interested in. I'm ready for the challenge and I'm excited to get going. So thank you. Welcome to the team. We are glad to have you. Any board questions or comment? We're way more fun in person. Way chatty. <laughs> Um, any community comment on this item? No one's raised their hand. Ms. Newman, please call the roll. Mr. Doman? Yes. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Mufeld? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Rollin? Welcome and yes. <laughs> Dr. Jessup Banger? Yes. Congratulations and welcome board. Thank you, everyone. Uh, our next item is a teaching and learning action item, graduation candidates. Uh, Ms. Fraley, this is you. Sorry, I had to get off mute there. Um, this is an exciting one for me. Um, so it is recommended that the school board approve the attached lists of graduates from East and West high schools with the understanding that students will complete all high school graduation requirements. And I so happily move. May I have a second? Second. I was like a little nervous there, people. Um, thank you, Mr. Rollins. Any uh, board comments on this item? Any community comment on this item? There are no hands raised. Uh, congratulations to all the students, to their parents um, who have been there along the way, family members, grandparents, extended family, friends, people who've cajoled students to get things done and get things in. Um, we're proud of you. You have uh, made it through this. Any comments or questions from our student board members that you would like to make in particular? I wanna give you another chance at this one. Nothing. Eva, I think you're on mute. Not on mute. Wait, is it working now? Yes. There we go. Okay, sorry, my computer's been slow. Okay. Um, honestly, I guess I kind of just feel really grateful that um, I got to be part of this um, school district. You know, I've been here since first grade. Um, I moved. So, um, you know, this place is really incredible. The teachers are really, really special. The students are really, really special. I found my friends and my family um, within these schools and within the programs and opportunities well with the school district has had to offer. So honestly, I just feel incredibly grateful that I get to say that um, on June 7th, whether or not it's in person or not in July, um, that um, I'm so grateful I get to call myself a well the East graduate. So um, that's all I have to say. I don't know if Jalissa has anything to say, but. Thank you, Eva. With Ava. Um, it's exciting. Um, I mean, it's, yes, it's sad, but I think we have to focus on the bigger picture that's going to get better soon. Um, no matter how long it's going to take, I just, I'm excited that we have an alternate solution because um, we could really just, you know, we could really just be in a position where we don't have any answers and at least we do have some. So there's something to look forward to. And um, the yard signs were amazing. My cap and gown like it's just it's it's exciting what we're doing forward and i'm very 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 grateful for everybody so thank you Did you guys get your pictures taken and get them submitted yet for no i have not yet oh, okay <laughs> it's on the to-do list yes it is awesome congrats to you both um and I look forward to being able to hand you some diplomas. I'm gonna hold out that we're gonna be able to do this in July. So I'm gonna keep hoping and dreaming until we, we, don't, we don't have any hope left and I'm, I'm not willing to give that up ever. So we will get there. 
Uh, Ms. Newman, I think we have to uh, do a roll call here so people can graduate. <laughs> Mr. Doman. Yes. Ms. Fraley. Yes. Mr. Meyer. Yes. Ms. Mewfeld. Yes. Mr. Phillips. Yes. Mr. Rollin. Yes. Dr. Jessup Anger. Yes, and congratulations to all of the graduates. Dr. Jess, Dr. Jessup Anger, before you move on to the next agenda item, can I just do a quick introduction? I can't even stop. You're like on the other side of the building. <laughs> uh, just to introduce, and I, people probably, most everybody knows Mike Perelski, but Mike is our, and his contract isn't being approved by the board because it'll come with all the other contracts because he's a current employee, but he's on here with us tonight. So I just want to introduce um, Mike Perelski, who was an AP at, well, not was, is currently an AP at East High School. And we'll be moving into that position. Um, we're excited to, to have him to, in a different role. We are excited to have him as he currently is at East High School. And Mike, I don't know if you want to say two sentences or more. I don't want to limit you to two. <laughs> I'll keep it succinct. So I just want to say thank you to everybody. I am uh, thrilled about the opportunity. Um, just being a, a Tulsa resident, graduate of the school district, and now having my own daughter go through the school system. I, I can't say enough about the great things that we do and just really excited to join the teaching and learning team and take on a, a new role and capacity and just thankful for the opportunity. So I really appreciate it. Congrats on the new role. We're excited that you're going to be in it. Thank you. Our next item is I've lost track. Um, superintendent action item. Uh, Mr. Doman? Nope, that's not superintendent. Superintendent action item, CISA representative appointment. Mr. Doman, this is you. It is recommended that the school board approve the appointment of board member Sharon Mufeld as district representative to the Cooperative Educational Service Agency number one. This appointment includes attending the annual convention held in May and I so move. May I have a second? Second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Um, any board discussion on this item? I would just share that, uh, Sharon, we very much appreciate your willingness and continued commitment to serving in this role. Um, it's an important relationship and um, we appreciate you playing this role on our board. Thank you, I'm happy to serve. Any community comment on this item? There are no hands raised. Um, Ms. Newman, please call the roll. Mr. Doman? Yes. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Mufeld? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Rollin? Yes. Dr. Jessup Anger. Yes, and that passes, thank you. The next up is a resolution, an action item, resolution urging federal and state action providing financial relief for Wisconsin's K-12 public schools in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and America's economic downturn. Um, this um, is work that was put together by uh, Sean and Leanne in our Legislative Advocacy Committee. Uh, and Sean, do you want to read the, um, read the, read and move? Sure. Uh, it is recommended the school board approve the resolution urging federal and state action providing financial re relief for Wisconsin's K-12 public schools in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and America's economic downturn and ISO move. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Mufeld. Um, Sean and or Leanne, do you want to uh, talk us through the information?
Sean, do you want to go ahead and I'll chime in? Sure. Well, the idea here is that um, there are big financial consequences to the economic downturn that the country and our state and our city are going through. One of those is the uh, impact on uh, local property taxes, um, income taxes and sales taxes. And as those, um, I guess, income sources for the um, you know, government um, decline, that puts stress on government entities. So what our resolution is asking for is um, for the federal government to remember to provide relief um, to these entities um, being our state. Um, so our state has the resources to then pass um, that revenue on to school districts so they can continue their operations and uh, remain stable. Um, I believe Wisconsin projects a $2 billion um, tax revenue decline uh, in the coming year. So that can't just be made up with, um, you know, good thoughts. It has to be made up with revenue from somewhere. Um, so our hope is that the federal government and our friends in Congress will remember to allocate some resources to our state, which can then be passed on to Wisconsin school districts. And also for our state, uh, our friends in the state legislature to remember that when they determine what to do with the uh, rainy day fund, um, it is a rainy day and our school districts um, should be funded in part with that rainy day fund. So that's what this resolution calls on those different groups to do. Leanne, anything I missed? The only thing I would add is that I think when um, we're throwing around gigantic numbers that are in the billions, it's really easy to lose sight of how much or how little um, the stimulus packages are covering. And I think a statistic that uh, hit home particularly for me was if you look at the innovation money that was being pumped into education in um, 2010 in Race to the Top and similar grants, the money that we're getting in response to this uh, COVID stimulus response bill is a tenth of that amount. So we were spending 10 times more to create innovation in schools a decade ago and what we're facing right now is a crisis that education has never witnessed before. And the, even though the numbers are gigantic, it's still just not even close to what districts will need to be able to recover from this. Um, and that's not to be doomsday-ish or anything, but to, to really match numbers with reality. Um, and to also say this is a great time for us to be innovative as well. Like tough circumstances force you to be creative. Um, and we've already seen a, a lot of innovation and creativity and sense of possibility with our teachers. Um, and we're just trying to make sure that um, our legislature is, is remembering how important what school district work is. Right, it ends up becoming a math problem, right? And if, um... The good news is that the Congress already allocated $13 billion to um, state and local governments um, as part of the first CARES Act. The issue is that Wisconsin alone projects a $2 billion loss. So you've got 13 billion for the entire country um, on one hand, and then you've got 2 billion for Wisconsin alone. Um, you can imagine how you know, larger states will have a much larger impact. So um, I believe groups like the National PTA and the School Boards Association and others have called on the Congress to pass like a $200 billion relief, which is outlined in the resolution. Um, and they believe that a number like that is going to be closer to the, to filling the need that will exist when we come out of this. Members of the board, questions and comments? I have a question. I had heard that um, there was talk of freezing the budget in July. Is that, are, are you hearing anything al along those lines? Uh, 
Who's that to? Uh, members of the Legislative Advocacy Committee or the administration. Well, I, I'll, I'll comment. I think we've heard a lot of things. Um, I, the reality is we know there's going to be a shortfall. How much of a shortfall is it actually going to be? Um, we don't know that. And so what is what impact is that going to be on on the school district? Yeah, I mean, the idea of freezing the budget or no increases from into the second year of the biennium is a, is a possibility. So they, they need to go, once revenues fall below a certain point of expenditures, they're required to have a budget stabilization bill put in place, or they have to require to meet, the gov governor's required to call the legislature into session, and then they address the budget. Is that going to happen? I think so. So something's, something's going to give somewhere along the line. Again, it's an issue of making sure we prepare for the worst and hope that it ends up better. And I think not just hoping, that's where I think this kind of work from our legislative advocacy committee comes in because it's a step to help us with some hope of making sure people remember and they, they hear the voice of the school boards um, across the country and us doing our part. So. Yeah, that's definitely my concern. I mean, we still have our expenses, even though this is all happening. And we're, you know, we're creatively addressing those expenses. So, um, so yeah, this, I wholly support this resolution coming forward and keeping it in the forefront. Any other board comment or question on this item? Not seeing it. Any community comment on this item? No hands raised. Okay. Um, thank you to Sean uh, and Leanne for your work on this. I think it's essential. Um, I wanna encourage uh, the board to do some thinking about how we can advocate uh, if this passes this evening uh, in calling legislators. Um, I've had some of our uh, legislative uh, legislators kind of reach out to find out what they can do to be supportive. Um, but I think we should be contacting folks, uh, not a partisan issue. Um, but my hope is that all of our legislators uh, in the TOSA um, area would be supporting public education, certainly here, but across the state of Wisconsin. Um, with that said, Ms. Newman, let's call the roll. Mr. Doman? Yes. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Mufeld? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Rollin? Yes. Dr. Jessup Anger? Yes. And that item passes. We are now moving into the business services action items. The first one is the McKinley Elementary bid package 001 and 002, partially scoped. Sean, can you read this item? Yes. Uh, it is recommended the school board approve. Oh, sorry. I'm on the wrong one. That's a, I think this was supposed to be Mike, right? Oh, no. My mistake. I was reading the wrong one. Okay, here we go. It is recommended that the school board approves the project at McKinley Elementary School bid package uh, number 001 and number 002, partially scoped for carpentry, fire suppression, plumbing, HVAC, electrical, landscaping, for a total of five million seventy thousand dollars, seventy thousand eight hundred twenty-one dollars, which is included in the referendum improvement budget, and I so move. May I have a second on this item? Second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Doman. Um, Dr. Erdl, Melissa, can you kind of take us through? what this is, where it's at, and um, kind of how it, how the bids played out. Uh, sure, yeah, I'll kick it off. Um, so McKinley is now 65%, um, if this is awarded, this will be 65% of the board, uh, I'm sorry, the subcontractor awarded. Uh, this particular package came in at $650,000 under budget, um, just because of the climate and the, the, the COVID 19 has played in the market. Um, we were able to lock in at very low rates. Uh, subcontractors are eager to 
um, lock and lock and work, especially in um, in in this climate. So yeah, uh, significantly under budget, uh, which is a good thing for the rest of the referendum work, and um, and all the bid awards that are being recommended tonight are low bid. Any questions or comments from the board on this item? This is Sean. I'd just like to say uh, thank you, uh, number one. And number two, just reacting to the number of bids that we got on this project um, is impressive. And just thank you for all the due diligence and homework to solicit for those bids. Okay. Any community comment on this item? Not seeing any. Ms. Newman, please call the roll. Mr. Doman? Yes. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Mufeld? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Rollin? Yes. Dr. Jessup Anger? Yes, and this item passes. Next up is the East High School Bid Package 001 Partially Scoped. Mr. Meyer, can you read this one? It is recommended that the school board approves the project at East High School Bid Package number 001 and number 002, partially scoped for roofing, metal panels, glazing, gypsum board, ceramic tile, painting, asphalt, for a total of $1,679,500, which is included in the donation and referendum improvement budget, and I so move. Thank you, may I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Rowland. Um, Melissa, can you walk us through this one, please? Yep, so this, this uh, subcontractor board of, um, approval uh, for recommendations of subcontractors is for the East Pool project, along with the locker rooms and the uh, finishing up the South parking lot uh, at East High School later this summer. Um, these are, this is right on budget. Um, so um, really it, it came in um, pretty much at the, at what we thought it would originally. Uh, this would wrap up about 85% of the award bid, um, awards that are recommended in bid for this specific project or these projects. Um, and we are currently working on the East Pool and uh, continue to and we'll uh, award the contractors uh, upon approval. Board comment or questions on this one? As I think I shared two weeks ago, uh, Ned Hughes has been doing some great reporting, um, dangerous as it may, it may look. Um, uh, on the East Pool renovations. And so if you're not on Twitter, I would encourage you to do so. Ned Hughes, Tosa 12 reporting, great stuff. Any board comment or community comment? No attendee hands is raised. Ms. Newman, can you call the roll on this? Mr. Doman? Yes. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Mufeld? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Rollin? Yes. Dr. Jessup Anger? Yes, and this passes. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I would echo what Sean uh, said earlier. It, it is, um, I'm grateful that we've been able to continue forward uh, and to do so safely um, with our, our various projects. I'm looking forward to the kids getting into the schools uh, using these facilities um, and being back in the buildings. I think that'll be a, a great day that we will enjoy celebrating very much. Uh, next up, teaching and learning reports, our district equity plan update and presentation. Uh, I believe Jay Henderson and Mike Brock are here to present and Dr. Ertl, uh, do you or one of your team wanna provide a kind of opening statement? Did you ask, who did you ask for the opening statement? Was that to, directed to Brock and myself? Uh, or Dr. Ertl, whoever. Okay. No, um, it's, it's our ongoing, ongoing work. It's the umbrella of our entire district and the work of our district. So 
obviously it's it's a plan that that drives what we do and who we are as a school district so i'll leave it to uh jay and mike and tracy and tracy Karras is presenting with us too tracy, yes. sorry tracy we also have a number of people that joined us that were on the team so they're 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 present and awaiting questions if needed so go ahead jay okay um i'll pull up our presentation i'm gonna share my screen with you Okay. Um, I'm gonna pull this up real quick. Okay, good. Well, I just wanted to take a moment just to thank the school board for just continuing to <clears throat> invest in this, this work. We feel like this is important work. I mean, even just now in the midst of all this, um, as we're looking at ways to respond, we know that we're gonna need to, to better meet the needs of our students moving forward. So. Um, your commitment to the equity work moving forward was just was really appreciated. So we just want to take a, a moment on behalf of the district equity team to thank the school board for your commitment to the work. So uh, when we, we we presented a couple months ago to the school board and, and we went through and reviewed, looked at how we started this process and we started by reviewing the equity plan from 2018 and uh, through uh, 20, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, 2018 through 2020. Um, we took a good look at it to really um, fantastic pieces in there that we wanted to keep and utilize. And uh, so our team came together and we reviewed it. We broke it down and then pulled everything out of there. Um, last time we, we presented to the board, we went through some of those things to really look at what we did. So those are all hyperlinked too, if you wanted to go in and look back at the old plans as well. Microphone, Tracy. All right. I'm just gonna say I hit it and then I must have like been a little nervous and hit it twice. I, uh, we hear you now. My big moment here. Um, so as a reminder that there was a district equity team that met monthly and planned and facilitate, facilitated by the wonderful Jay and Mike. So we appreciate um, everything that you did to make this come together. Wide range of representatives, parents, students, um, teachers, administrators um, from all levels um, across our district. And there are probably about 30 to 40 um, different participants at the time. One of the things that I really appreciated was um, just being able, being a part of the rich discussions that happened, especially because I live in this elementary world. So able to be able to hear from middle school, high school, parent perspective, student perspective, was super important in putting this together so that we had all the different viewpoints. And that was one of the things that I greatly appreciated about being on this team. So thank you guys. Um, thank you everybody for allowing this work to be a part of this district. Thank you, Tracy. Um, so as we started looking at this work, I um, mean, just trying to figure out what direction we wanted to go, um, we just started seeing some themes emerging from all the work that we're doing. In our mission, um, in our school improvement plans, um, in our in our um, in our district goals, and in our vision of a graduate, we just kept seeing these these themes emerging: belonging, achievement, and opportunity. Just keep coming, keep coming up again and again. And so we made this graphic to kind of show um, how we felt like there's this core belief in the center. So when belonging and opportunity and achievement all kind of come together, when we're taking care of these three themes for our students in the center. Um, when a student feels safe and connected to her educational community, and when she's provided access to rigorous, relevant, and meaningful learning opportunities, she will excel academically. And that was kind of this foundational belief that really drove some of our work forward. Um, we got to a place of, uh, you know, our final review feedback. That's pretty much the, the most up-to-date spot where we were after the last meeting. Um, we sent out the the general final copy of the plan to our team members and to uh we also uh zoomed into a meeting with all the administrators um and the major major feedback we got from those two groups was that we had kind of unanimous agreement that the new plan aligns with our district mission and vision and when we started working on this plan and then had some meetings with mark and kristen early on um mark made a statement that you know equity 
is what we do. That is that that goes throughout everything that we do as a district. It's the foundational piece of of the work that we do. So it's not so much that we're doing equity, but equity is what we do. Um, and we kind of really had a great across the board. We had no disagreements on the fact that people really saw that our new plan aligns with our district mission and vision. And not only that, but in the final version that we'll be sharing with you. Um, we had a unanimous agreement as well that, that these things are actionable and connected to work in the buildings. These are real life applicable things that we could do and execute in the 2020 through 2022 school years. So we're just going to take a quick moment just to kind of walk you through the plan and we just want to point out a couple of highlights, um, a couple of key points within that plan. So we first of all tied each theme um, to a district goal. And I think we showed you that before. So the first theme we have is opportunity. Um, and that aligns again to our, our district goal number one. All students have access to rigorous learning experiences, programming, and coursework to prepare them for post high school education, uh, careers, and citizenship. Again, it's the opportunities that we're providing now and in the future. So we really felt like that's talking about, again, that theme opportunity. So with each theme tied to our district goal, we then created a goal statement, a visionary, goal statement. So here for opportunity, all students, families, all students, families will have opportunities to access networks of resources ensuring current and future success. Um, and then from there, we decided to help well, the team, the team, um, we really worked on how do we make that happen then? How do we create that, that, um, how do we make that actionable? How do we create that into an action step? Um, so we thought that we wanted to focus on, on actionable items that we can really accomplish and really narrow in on. Um, as, as we really want to focus again the work on what's currently happening um, and as we move forward. And so our action step for opportunity we came up with develop a plan for all students families uh, again uh, to have an, uh, um, access to a network of resources and trying current and future success. But we also wanted to provide strategies. We didn't want to make mandates as far as this is what you have to do for the plan but just suggested strategies because we recognize in every building there's different needs there's different communities. Um, that in different populations um, within those buildings. So we really wanted the strategies to be opportunities for, for buildings to kind of share the great work that's happening and again to offer. Um, these are some possible ways to get that action step done. We identified people responsible and then we broke out um, what we want to see happening at the end of each year. So there's a timeline uh, by the end of uh, 2021 and by the end of 2022. One more um, item I want to point out for this is our measurable outcome. We really, again, wanted to tie to the work that's happening. And since we're doing parent surveys, we're doing um, satisfaction, uh, uh, um, we're doing student perception and, and, and tracking satis yeah, excuse me, satisfaction on student surveys, we thought that that's the work that's already happening. So why not tie um, the work to a metric that we're already collecting? Uh, theme number two was a, a belonging. And uh, this is broken up a little bit differently, but uh, it, it's still the same format. Um, the Wauwatosa School District is a place where all, all children, staff, and families are valued and welcomed is the heading for belonging. And if you look in the, uh, the theme box, the, the plan goal itself, you'll see two hyperlinks there. One is the HR plan and vision, and the other is the family and community engagement plan and vision. Um, we wanted to make sure that we included the, you know, those two aspects in there, but we also needed to give uh, uh, Mr. Garrison and Ida like the, the freedom to do what they need to do within our, within our own departments in order to facilitate the sense of belonging. So um, they have their own plans in their own departments, but we really wanted to make sure that it was linked into the work that we're doing under this heading of sense of belonging. But we also needed to give them, grant them the autonomy to do what they needed to do um, in, in their work. So um, we have the goal statements listed there and, and what we're looking to do and, and how we're trying to, to get there. Um, we want to make sure that, that we're teaching and learning take place in a safe environment, um, pretty relevant today. Uh, we want to make sure that students have a voice in their education and that the Wauwatosa School District, the, the, the physical spaces are welcoming and represent the student population that we have. Um, so when we look at the action step, we want to deliver instruction that is responsive and supportive of our diverse learners. Um, and then we look at the suggested strategies um, and we have a list of those. 
Um, and then like, like uh, Jay explained before, we have goals for 2020 and 2021 and 2021, 2022. Um, a lot of it has to do with the physical space aspect of it, um, forming some teams and, and committees and really uh, trying to give some, some decorative and, and, and uh, you know, wall space ownership to our students um, to make sure that they're really represented and, and that their cultures and, and, and their, you know, the, where they come from, their background and histories are represented in our schools um, to really work on that sense of belonging and that feeling of inclusiveness that we're looking for in our students. So yeah, we're going to be end of like a, a, a Jay's highlighting that we're going to be developing the advisory group. Um, hopefully, advisory groups will be able to meet with administrators um, and and share in some of those decision making processes um, that would take place. Um, we have the people that we have the suggested strategies that we're going to you know look at those those committees and those committees are going to really have an impact in in a, and have a say going forward in our buildings um, and then we have the people who are responsible um, and then really looking at helping those groups to, to make some of those decision, you know, decisions at a building base level. You can go on, Jay. Okay. So that was belonging and we have three action steps. So the, the, the final theme we have is achievement. Um, and I really feel like this is a great example of how um, there's this K-12 alignment on this on the, the plan and how we really want to focus on um, actionable steps that we can take across our entire district. Um, and again, we really want to focus on the, on the work that we're doing. So our goal is, um, you know, that, that aspirational goal, all students will reach their full potential. Um, and then, you know, <clears throat> tying that to, you know, our, our, our mission statement of really delivering that outstanding education to all students, K-12. Um, so we have two action steps. Uh, for achievement and the first one is plan and deliver a rigorous education k-12 and then again the second one is engage all staff regularly in practices that improve teaching and learning in all classrooms again tied very closely to the work that we're doing um, when we start looking at suggested strategies the measurable outcomes the timeline it's a lot of the tying our tying, tying our instruction to the wisconsin or not, to the wauwatosa um, instructional framework um, to universal design for learning um, we've got um, some AVID, um, uh, an AVID framework and, and strategies that we've taken on at the secondary level that we want to spread throughout the entire district again and really using that opportunity to focus on ELA. Again, that's the work that we're going to be doing. And instead of just making ELA, um, you know, the best that it can be, but also putting that focus on equity as well, how to make it um, instructionally equitable for all students. Um, because again, we know that that's going to be the focus moving forward. So as again, as we tie, try to tie it to all the work that we're doing, whether it's AVID or UDL or um, CoServe, CoPlan, um, all these models in place, we want to extend off of the work that we're doing. Um, again, and we, we feel like that's the best way to kind of measure the outcomes, um, to tie it to the work that we're already, we're already doing so that we can collect um, and, and, and look at the metrics that we examine currently. So um, that's the end of our plan. And we, at, at the end of this presentation, we included just some, some highlights um, for each theme. There is the overall theme in the district plan, uh, district, the goal um, that it ties to, um, our, our goal statements and our action steps. So that's for opportunity. Again, kind of a summary for belonging um, with our theme, goal statements, and action steps, and the same thing for achievement. So. Well, we want to thank the entire team again for their Absolutely. opportunity, for their input. Um, I can stop sharing now and we can open it up for questions. Lord, please jump in uh, as you'd like. You can raise your hand or just start talking. I, I have a couple questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, team. Thank you. Um, one thing is, it seems like your initial work is completed and you've met a lot routinely. Are you going to continue that work? And meeting together and making sure that there's progress? Kristen? 
The short answer, Mrs. Mufeld, is yes. Um, <laughs> Mr. Brock and Mr. Henderson uh, had a conversation with uh, Mr. Carter and I about that and um, our desire to have them continuing to work throughout next school year to check in on progress, to get feedback, and to see if we need to make any adjustments along the way. But yes, there is, we definitely intend to keep the district equity team going and for the two of them to continue working with them. Yeah, we, okay. want to make sure we're, we want to make sure we're scaffolding any of these pieces for the administrators and the people who are, are doing it because to do it without that, that piece. I mean, there, there's some pieces that, that people may have to do or that they're asked to do that, that we may need to do some legwork for them in, a, in order to make sure that they have everything that they need to do it. Yes, and it seems like uh, each thing builds on another. So yeah, that um, that's helpful. We did have, I don't know if you saw the chat, we did have some questions Deb, from the community. Yeah. The yeah. Deb Gaelic, yeah. So yeah. We'll, I wasn't sure if there's another comment besides um, Deb Gaelic dynamic learning maps. Is that the comment you're talking about? Yeah, that's, that's right. the comment I saw. So yeah. yeah, I can respond to that if if everybody's okay with that. This is Teresa sure. Kwiatkowski. I'm the supervisor of special education for the district. Um, so the DLM is the dynamic learning map assessment. That is an assessment that is used for um, less than 1% of our student population. It's students with the most significant special education needs, the most complex learners. So um, in regard to the question about um, should that be included, if you look at the goals, the actual goals that, um, that we have in the equity plan, some of the things that we talk about is we talk about um, using our ELA and our math curriculum, looking at our ELA and math curriculum, we put some strategies in place around that, including like common summative assessments, having steering committees. So our, our, um, our strategy for that goal is, uh, is um, connected to our, e our general education ELA and math curriculum. So therefore the measurable outcome that we would look at is our forward data, data and our ACT data. For our students who are taking the dynamic learning map, they are not part of our general education ELA curriculum or our ELA or, or our math curriculum. So it would not be appropriate to use DLM assessment data to measure our progress on our general education math and, math and ELA curriculum. Um, that for those students, when we start looking at building and um, when we look at student performance data, all student performance data, when we're looking at school improvement plans, that's when that data is taken into consideration. But it would not be an appropriate data point to assess the effectiveness of our ELA and math curriculum. Okay, and I would, I would defer to you in knowing that, so I yeah. trust yeah. you. Yeah, so that's good, okay, good yeah. answer. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions for now. Other questions or comments from the board? Yeah, this is Sean. I think I've got two. Um, so one, just sort of building on that, um, what accountabilities can we build in for that population? If if that's not the right one, you know, are there ways to that are appropriate to track it um, in your view? And then the second question I've got is related to the measures that we've got for sort of each outcome area. And if um, just the situation that we're in now, um, are we feeling like we've got reliable benchmarks or are we gonna feel like we have to go back to the drawing board for new benchmarks just based on this new reality? Um, you know, and the situation that students are going through, is it fair to compare those apples to apples? Um, just so we've got good measures and we're sticking with them, but also taking into account, I guess, reality. But I, I guess I would say like this is the plan, you know, based on an ideal world and rolling into next year, if we had all the resources that we need, this is what we want to do. That might change, you know, and I think we have the flexibility within the plan and, and you know, from all of the support that I've heard, you know, if we need to shift resources and attention um, into other areas because of the crisis that we're, we're going through, I think, you know, we'll, we'll probably take that on as a district and do that well, but I think in an ideal world, I, get, I think this is the work that we want to invest in. Um, but just again, I don't, I don't know what our resources and, and you know, what, what, what the start of next year is going to look like and, um, and where we're going to be at. So 
does does that does that help like in the thinking just again i mean if, if we're in a perfect world this is kind of where we want to be but um and there's a lot of unknowns out there i guess is where we're going to be at starting in september yeah i mean i guess my question is you know we put out measures that we really want to hang our hat on so if we're going to select some measures i just want to make sure that you know a year from now we still have confidence in that and that we're not sort of this is going to like sound harsh and I don't mean for it to, but I mean like coming up with an excuse as to why that's not the correct measure or that wasn't the correct benchmark, um, you know, and things happen and that happens and that's okay. But to the extent that we can, you know, look, instead you know, of a measure that we believe in that we're going to still believe in a year from now or several years from now is, you know, something I think we should really endeavor to if we can. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think that uh, we, we talked with Mark and Kristen about that as well when we all of a sudden we were nine tenths of the way done with this plan and then this pandemic hit and we we had some of those same questions, Sean, when we were looking at and going like, holy cow, like is this plan relevant for going forward with all the changes that have happened? Um, and the you know maybe Kristen and Mark can respond to that but they, they gave us a very good response you know basically generally saying like we got to stay the course we plan for emergency stuff but the things we want to accomplish with equity we're not going to deviate from that we're not going to change what we're looking for because equity is what we do this is how we execute and with that being said we we need to you know focus on that for now and and Kristen was saying, uh, you know, we, we'll be flexible. We need to be flexible with those things. But opportunity and belonging, monumental in our kids and our students and our, our population coming back. Like, how are we making sure we're meeting those kids' needs? And what are we doing to meet them in the social emotional aspect? How are we making sure we're, we're dealing with a worldwide trauma, not just our individual students in our, in our schools trauma, but worldwide trauma? How do we do that collectively, you know, help lift them up? How do we increase that sense of belonging? How do we increase those pieces? Um, so I don't think those things would change. Kristen or Mark, do you have something to add to that? My, uh, my thoughts were um, really around um, the question that Mrs. Newfield asked about the committee. Um, I think we don't know what's coming in September. We don't know what's going to happen throughout the year next year. But with that committee being intact and um, being able to make adjustments and moving towards um, the work that we want done. The plan is a, it's a great plan in my opinion. It's where we need to go. Um, what's going to have to be adjusted will be the pace um, and the approach to getting there based on how we open up next year, um, how the year proceeds. But having that committee in place to make this a living plan is really what's gonna make this effective. I don't think it will change the outcomes we want or the direction we wanna go. It's just how do we get there is what's going to have to be adjusted because we just don't know what the unknown looks like. And that sense of belonging measure, correct me if I'm wrong in this, we didn't do that this year, so we would be comparing ourselves to the 2019 survey. We are actually going to be um, administering that survey to students, so we will have that data from this year as well. Well, and then, you know, I, I know Willie had brought up, too, that the plan is, is fluid. You know, I mean, it, it, every couple yeah. of years, look at, you know, what do we need to do? What do we need to change? Um, so the beauty of having a two-year plan is that we'll revisit it in a couple of years. And if it's not relevant work, Sean, at that point, if it's not what we want to continue working on, then we'll make adjustments and then we'll, we'll, we'll refocus on areas that we need to refocus on. Yeah. No, there's nothing in, like, the plan that I disagree with, or I think it's totally right. I think the, you know, what I would love to do is just have a plan with measures that we get to the finish line and then we feel like, uh, you know, we can either celebrate the success of reaching the goal or we, um, you know, we didn't and then we retool. Um, but what, um, what I would not, prefer to do, I guess, is to get a year from now and say like, well, that wasn't really like the right measure. And I know it's hard right now to figure out exactly what that should be. I just, for me, especially like in my work, um, like just creating good, smart goals that we can like really be held accountable to. And I just think as a school board, that's like something that we um, are being asked to do too. 
is just to say like we have to have goals that are accountable and we reach for. So if we feel good about these and we're even amidst this, um, then I'm good with it. But I just wanted to flag that just so a year from now, we're not saying, well, you know, pandemic. Yeah. I don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mr. Ronald, I appreciate that. And um, in the plan, one of the things that I am most excited about within goal three is our plan around developing common formative or common summative assessments. So that will give us some more really usable data internally as a district. And we won't be relying just on forward or on ACT, but um, some more real time data for our teachers to be using along the way. So I think that that's gonna be something that um, will provide a lot of benefit to us as we are um, making those adjustments throughout that two year um, timeframe to help us get to those other measures along the way. I was gonna echo that exact same thing, Kristen. I think in that goal three, some of those long-term measures are actually um, something that we're tracking and measuring throughout those common summative assessments. So they actually become that formative measure of how we're progressing in that long-term goal. And even more important in the path that we're on right now, because it's gonna really inform what unfinished learning do our students um, need to be mastering before we you know, get to that long-term goal. So I think that's a really, really important question to be asking. Mm -hmm. I echo that statement too, uh, Sean. We know that equity has to have accountability, um, infrastructure, and resources. And those three themes um, that we see in the plan currently, um, I think we'll be able to make those uh, rightful adjustments if, if needed. Um, like you said, we don't want to get to the point where we get to next year and be like, oh, we should have made some changes. And so that statement is definitely a part of the accountability conversations that will, like Kristen and Mark has already said, we will continue um, having those moving into um, the next school year. So again, thank you for your comment. Yeah. If I could just add a comment, I want to thank all of you for the work you've done on this. I think we've said it many times, but we need to continue to say that it's incredibly important for our district to to have this focus um, regardless of the situation we're in. So I'm, I'm grateful that, um, you know, Mr. Carter and, and Ms. Bowers um, gave you the direction and I'm sure you would have done it regardless, but that, you know, we're going to continue to go forward regardless of what situation we're currently in because the true equity plan is not really about, you know, developing a plan of, you know, what happens when a teacher is standing in front of a classroom, but it's what are we going to do as a district regardless of the situation that we're in. So everything we need to do, needs to always be looking through the, the focus and the lens of equity. So that sounds exactly like what you're doing. So I greatly appreciate that. And I think this actually gives us a great opportunity to kind of re-examine our practices and where we're at and are we really equitable across um, all spaces and everywhere we go. So um, it's a challenge. I have no doubt. I have no doubt you guys are meeting the challenge, but um, it's also an opportunity to really show that we can do this across a broad spectrum. Um, the only comment I have, and it's not really a question, is you know, really continue to focus on keeping this as an ingrained part of our culture. Um, you know, I, I know we haven't just said, here's what we're going to do and kind of dropped it there. It's been years and years of work and we're continuing to do it, but let's just keep that focus of, you know, new teacher hires, new, you know, new administrative staff hires that they're well aware of the plan and not just in year one or week one, but, you know, year two, three, four, you know, we're always rolling this out to the staff and keeping them, keeping them front and center. I, I know we did it last year during the kickoff and you know things like that are just so important that all teachers understand this is part of our culture going forward and it's not going to change this is important and if you're going to be part of Wauwatosa this is what you need to to be part of so um, that would be my only you know words and thoughts is just you know how do we continue to always keep this front and center because it is we're, we're not going to be successful if we're not successful at this plan at least that's my belief so appreciate all the hard work you have doing and, and um, keep it up thank you very much Hey, you're welcome, Steve. We uh, we also, Jay mentioned it at the beginning, but I also want to reiterate it that there are nearly 40 people, um, and we have uh, eight of them here tonight um, that were on this committee that, that came together and volunteered their time and left after school and after their jobs to come in and, and help us build this. So we really want to acknowledge the fact that we had a huge team behind us. We have a small group representing today, but it was an incredibly, you know, successful effort on a lot of people's parts to, to come together and put this together and we could not have done it without them. So 
So I have a question about um, how this like larger plan can become really tangible to like the classroom teacher. And so I love the framework. I love it so much. I shared it with a colleague today who's doing some equity work down in Charleston. Um, the way we're talking about opportunity, achievement, and belonging. And I think a lot of times it's it's not an achievement gap that we have. It's actually an opportunity gap. Yes. What we're putting in front of kids is actually not high enough caliber. It's not expecting enough, et cetera. Um, and so one of the things I'm curious about, and, and I'm not going to use the right language, but I feel like there's the instructional framework and then there's this, like how, how much do they align so that teachers aren't feeling like I've got to check all these boxes and all these different frameworks? Because um, when I look at this framework, this to me is how I would design a lesson, right? Like, what are the standards? Like, what is it that, you know, a, a great common assessment, Kristen, as soon as you said common assessments, I like cheered silently here to myself. Um, but how am I making sure that those assessments are high quality and then how am I making sure that at the same time they're creating you know space and safety and psychological safety especially coming out of what we are so can you talk to a little bit about how that instructional framework practice whatever you want to call it and how this fit together so that it seems seamless and connected to in instructors Yes. Um, so our instructional framework is uh, absolutely 100% rooted in equity. It speaks to that um, right up front for teachers. Um, it talks about the different ways to provide access to students, um, how to plan those lessons. So it lays it out really, really nicely. And our principals have um, been working with coaches to guide teachers through that work. That's embedded in their uh, school improvement plans. So many of them um, had that at the forefront of their goals the last two years in terms of equity and how to provide equity in their buildings. And so I see that continuing to be the case uh, moving forward as we're rolling out this plan and really getting it embedded. Because as, as you were um, referencing, like that's like the art and science of teaching, right? And that's if we could take all these things that are on these documents and have them come to life in a classroom, that's when we will achieve the educational equity we want to have for all of our kids. So um, you know, we will keep working as an administrative team with our, with our principals and with our coaches and our instructional leaders to make sure that those things are happening. One thing I might add too is um, there are a couple pieces of the plan um, indicating change for instruction and for teachers. One is looking at the role of content team leaders and trying to uh, support them in better assisting teachers in the instructional area, exactly Leanne, what you're, what you're talking about. Um, and the other is um, co-plan, co-serve, our co-plan, co-serve model, really uh, re-examining that and making that more coherent and again, that would directly impact the classroom instruction as well. So those are two big pieces that we're looking at making changes and moving forward per the equity plan. Yeah, the one thing I would just like really advise you all to think about is that it seems really obvious to all of you and the 40 people that were on this committee how this all fits together. I think sometimes the folks who've done the work, it's so obvious to them like how this all fits together. And I would say your biggest focus area actually is going to have to be communications and getting people not just to say I understand, but like can they actually articulate back to you how this all fits together and why is it different? Because if, if, it, if it's already embedded in the instructional framework, then why this new plan? Like what's changed? Like how am I operating differently? Um, and not, this is not a question of capability. It's a question of like truly how do they internalize this when they haven't had the hours together and the, the think time and the book reading because they're, they're trying to like run a classroom, right? So like how do we make sure that they not only just get the information, but they have their reflection time and they can have conversations with principals to be like, okay, this is what I think it means for me in my classroom and my own development areas and where I'm weak and where I'm strong um, for sort of the intentionality to come through. So I, I would just want us to make sure that our plan is as strong in how we communicate this and check for understanding with our teachers 
as how we would plan and check for understanding with our students. Because sometimes I think we overestimate adults' ability. Like, we're always like, do as I say, not as I do sometimes. Or at least that's the way it is with my own experience with adult learning. <laughs> so that's just my, my two cents on something I'd think about. Other comments or questions from the board? Um, yes, Eric, I just had a thought. And what I appreciate about these meetings is the opportunity to have the conversation. So uh, with our opportunity with virtual learning, and it's quite possible we'll go in and out of phases of virtual learning over the next, I'm not sure when. Is it better? Do some are some of the barriers removed in this in virtual learning? I, I, I was just thinking out loud, I guess. <laughs> so if no one has to respond, but I was just thinking maybe the maybe the team could talk about you know some of the implications of virtual um, education and how that might actually help us and give us an opportunity. I'll, I'll jump in on that, Sharon. Does it help us? I think for some kids, it might be, might be better. But what I've really grown to understand over the past six weeks is because I used to have this belief that we can do virtual education. 15 years ago, I thought we can put a bunch of kids and we can just do nothing but virtual and they'll be fine. The value of face-to-face, -face, that interaction and that work with our teachers and I mean, to me, it's become more and more um, critical in my belief, but that's more important. That re I mean, that relationship's always been important. I'm, I'm getting get probably too deep on this. That relationship has always been much more important than what is being taught because that's the exchange. Um, that's where the magic kind of happens. And I, just, I don't know. Yeah, virtual is great. I think there's some things that we can, I've been excited about the opportunities and what we're going to be able to do after this whole pandemic is done with everybody's ability to operate in a virtual world. I think there's some things we can take from it and we'll always be part of who we are and what we do and it's going to make us a lot stronger. But I would agree with you that I think it's a conversation to be had. Yeah, just included in the whatever we're calling the, re, the rebound or restart physical school plan. So... But thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you all for your great work on this. I, I look forward to these, these updates. Um, and while I think, Mr. Doman, your point earlier of any equity plan would provide us a framework of how we think about these things. I think these are, are particularly important challenges. And even as a parent, seeing uh, language and kind of thoughtfulness of how the teachers are approaching third grade um, assignments and how they're kind of looking for what you can see little things of that they're taking into account access to technology and are parents always available uh, to be sitting with kids and um, kind of flexibility of the curriculum being delivered in this virtual environment. Uh, it is clear to me um, that there's, there's, there's a level of thoughtfulness uh, that is that is in place, uh, and I'm excited we're building upon it. Uh, any community comment on this item? There is no vote on this. This is just an update. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us for this work, uh, for finding ways to make sure that every kid is affected um, and educated to our greatest capacity. Um, I hope you all get some rest and uh, thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next item is Children's Wisconsin Mental Health Proposal. Um, Ms. Bowers and Mr. Carter, I believe you are going to be sharing a bit about uh, this one as a report as well. I'm going to jump in quick before they go and just kind of let you know that this is more of a school-based mental health proposal presentation versus just Children's Wisconsin, although we do have a couple of reps from Children's 
here with us tonight, and that is a component of it. There's a, uh, it's a bigger, um, bigger program. So I will turn it over to them. All right, I'm just gonna get our presentation pulled up here. So we will, we're gonna start um, just as the case with the, just as was the case with the equity plan earlier, we are gonna start with a reminder of those three district goals. Those are the, um, the pieces that we use to ground our collective work when we are bringing forward any presentation to the board. And so um, those were loud and clear in the equity plan tonight. They continue uh, to guide us as we move forward with this information too. Um, in early, um, I'm sorry, it was more late January, uh, you had a presentation from Sonia Phillips, who is our content team leader for mental health in the district, and she provided an update to the board on um, the work of the district's mental health committee over the last year, and she shared this graphic with all of you that has a variety of data points that we are continuing to use and analyze as we are looking at the best, me best methods for us to be putting into place to support student social and emotional health. Um, Sonia shared with you the work of the team this year was to look at six different categories. They were working through um, ethics and boundaries issues, advocacy, marketing, record keeping, identification, uh, looking at exploring different training opportunities to make sure that our student services staff is equipped and confident to deliver uh, mental health interventions and improving reentry collaboration with outside agencies. And the work of this team is continuing yet this spring. They are actually meeting later uh, this week to continue to have some discussions about some of the work that's uh, in place here. Also during her presentation, Mrs. Phillips shared this uh, graphic from DPI, which describes the school mental health framework. Um, this is a system-wide approach that is necessary to meet the needs of all students. And this is something that we will continue to be working on as a district. Um, under the guidance of Mr. Peralski, who is our new director of student services, uh, mental health and social emotional health of students will be a priority for his work with, um, with us here in the district next year. So tonight we want to talk a little bit more specifically about our plans um, to expand our partnerships with outside agencies to support students in their mental health um, when they have concerns that go above and beyond what our student services staff in our school buildings are uh, able to provide. Um, and before we go into um, our proposal, we wanted to make sure to um, remind you of some of the things that we currently have in place in the district or maybe give you some additional information. So for the last four years, we have had a partnership with Aurora Student Family Assistance Program. And um, that is in place for all families in the school district. All district families have access to this resource. Um, they are provided with six free sessions per concern per family member at any point um, during the school year. If their needs go above and beyond those six sessions, Aurora works with the family to connect them with another outside resource so that they're able to get the support that they need. Um, we have seen our family access to that service grow over the last several years and um, we typically are seeing that our um, families with students at the secondary level tend to be accessing that more um, than at the elementary level. A second service that uh, we have in place is one that we refer to as Counseling Connections. And that began as a pilot in 2018, 2019 at Madison School with a collaboration um, with an agency out of Waukesha called Family Service. Um, again, we refer to that, um, to our version of that program here in the district as Counseling Connections. Uh, with parent permission and collaboration, we have a licensed therapist on site to deliver therapy services to students in need. Um, that pilot showed great success in student engagement and behavior uh, and attendance data at Madison during its pilot year that we decided to expand those services to students at Underwood USTEM and um, uh, Jefferson during the 2019-20 school year. And tonight we have uh, several individuals from those schools here to share more about their experiences working specifically with that program. And before uh, I turn it over that, to them to share, I wanna take a minute to just introduce them. Um, our principal from Madison Elementary School, Nicole Marble is here. 
Principal Jenny Keats from Underwood USTEM, Jenny Schultz, Principal at Jefferson, Ryan Bonneman, who is the school counselor at Madison Elementary, and Hannah Moore, who is the school counselor at Jefferson. Um, Amy Nolan is the school counselor at Underwood USTEM. She wanted to be here tonight, but she has a, uh, an online class of her own, so unfortunately she's not able to join us. Um, Mrs. Marble, do you want to talk a little bit um, and share a little bit of, with the board about your experience working with this? You've had it in your school for the last couple of years. Yes, thank you, Mrs. Bowers. I would be more than happy to um, talk a little bit with the board. Um, thank you so much for having me here tonight. Um, Counseling Connections has been a, um, a huge success at Madison Elementary School um, over the last two years. Last year, we were able to provide services to 13 different students throughout the course of the year. And this year, we have had the opportunity to provide services to um, 19 different students throughout the year. Um, upon closure, we were currently servicing 18 students and at present 72% of the students that um, were currently being seen continue services during our extended closure. So that speaks to the commitment that the families have and the students have and the, the growth that the, that the children have um, accomplished in receiving this service. Um, as I think about the equity work that we are doing, this is one of those resources that really provides additional, an, an additional vehicle for students to be able to um, have access to their learning, to their growth, um, socially and emotionally. And when we look at the vision of a graduate, it really does encompass all of the different um, capacities that we are looking to grow for that vision of a graduate. Um, anecdotally, um, the really the greatest benefit that I've seen not only in student growth and access to um, additional opportunities for academics and social emotional um, participation is really the, the fact that we as a school staff have the opportunity to work um, very closely in partnership with the therapists and the families to provide the most um, comprehensive wraparound care for students. We um, um, are able to invite therapists into the classroom to do observations to see what potential barriers are getting in the way of students being able to access um, their daily school um, opportunities. And that has proven to be very beneficial for us, um, for, for the children and the, the greater school community. Um, so that's been our, um, our, our biggest success, I would say, in terms of being able to help children. Thank you, Mrs. Marble. Mrs. Schultz or Mrs. Keats, anything you'd like to add? Sure, Mrs. Bowers, I'd be happy to jump in and share my experience this year at Jefferson. So I'm Jenny Schultz, principal at Jefferson Elementary School. And I have to say when Mrs. Bowers reached out to me about a year ago at this time, I was thrilled that we would be considering expanding mental health counseling to our students as Jefferson, because I really saw that our, our students could really benefit from the service. A lot of things that I will add, um, Mrs. Marble kind of summarized with her experience at Madison. But it, the addition of counseling connections to our school community has been extremely beneficial. Through that lens of equity, I have seen the power of having this service right on site at our school building during the school day. It really truly does remove barriers for our families to be able to access services that students truly do need. I mean, it's a, so beneficial to have a clinical mental health therapist who provides services one day a week at our building. It's been um, kind of interesting to see the students who have taken advantage of that service. Um, about half of the students who are currently engaged in mental health counseling are families that we have worked very closely with for the past several years and kind of reached out and said, we think this service may be beneficial um, and really have a close relationship with these families to have those conversations. Um, interesting and kind of surprising to me this year, about half of our students who are currently working with Counseling Connections are families that reached out to us um, through our communications and I wouldn't necessarily say advertising, but putting the word out that this service was available at our school during the school day. It was really surprising to me, some of the students and families who reached out to take advantage of that service. Um, I was expecting more of myself and Hannah to do more of that outreach. Um, so that was really nice to see that our community as a whole was receptive to mental health counseling and having their students access that counseling service during the school day. 
At the time of the school closure back in March, we were actually at capacity at Jefferson. Um, we have our mental health counselor on site one full day a week, and we actually had a waiting list for services. We had students and families who had filled out paperwork, had gone through the insurance verification, and we were hoping that perhaps a seat may open up so we could provide that service. So I think that speaks a little bit to the need of the service in our schools right now. One thing that I think makes the program a success is the intentional scheduling that happens so that students can receive this service during the school day, but not miss those key priority instructional times of the day. And Hannah, our counselor, does a tremendous job collaborating with classroom teachers, getting schedules, having a leg up on schedule changes to make sure that students are not missing out on you know, field trips or fun learning opportunities to be able to attend their counseling session, because I don't think our students would be a big fan of counseling if they had to miss out on a fun STEM activity to attend that counseling session. Um, the other big benefit I see with Counseling Connections is just the majority of health insurance networks that our providers are part of. I think sometimes for our families, um, that is a barrier because they may have health insurance, but the provider they want to work with is not within that network, and it's more costly to receive that service. And in our experience, um, the providers that, that work with us through Counseling Connections are part of major health carriers networks and also work with Medicare, Medicaid, and also CHIP, which is the child version of Medicaid. Um, so it's really a nice cost-effective option for many of our families. And then just echoing on what Mrs. Marble said, I think when you look at our equity plan and our Virginia Matosa graduate, it's an absolute must that we provide this opportunity for our students, especially at the elementary level, to learn coping skills and really be empowered, you know, to advocate for themselves and what they need in the classroom. And anecdotally, I think that's the biggest change I've seen in some of the students who are receiving this service, that they work with our therapists they learn new strategies and coping techniques and they're able to go back to their classrooms and really advocate and put words behind what their need is. Um, the other huge value add that I see, similar to what Mrs. Marble spoke to, is just having access to that child therapist on our staff. There are many times that we may have a situation and I can speak to her about a student, you know, confidential or a situation I'm having and get advice proactively you know, to learn new strategies and tools that maybe we haven't considered trying or we try, but we could tweak to better meet that student's needs. So just a tremendous value add, um, having access to this child therapist at our school, even just one day a week this year. Thank you. Um, anything from Ryan or Hannah from the school student services perspective that you'd like to add? I would, yeah, I would just echo everything I've heard so far, but, um, you know, on a personal note, it's been awesome to collaborate with um, a mental health therapist and see families receive uh, that service is awesome and, and you can see it as, as a great success and, and a success that has removed a lot of barriers from families having to go and drive to a clinic, come back, you know, miss, miss you know, possibly an hour plus of education, the parent has to take off, um, you know, maybe an hour or more of work. Um, so just having that within the school uh, is a huge plus. Thank you. Um, and also family service makes it very easy to work with them. Um, being able to talk, we have Miss Jen in our building, She's always there to talk to, um, always available via email or phone. And she's just great to collaborate with and talk through student needs. Thank you. Um, I'll turn it over to Mr. Carter and he will walk you through um, the service we're receiving through St. A's. Thank you. Um, last year uh, with Madison's success uh, with the program and all the benefits that their students receive from that program, um, we had the staff at uh, Longfellow reach out to counselors and ask, uh, why can't we do that as well? We have a great need. Um, we really could make sure we could use that uh, the counseling service to the fullest. If there ever is a chance to expand, can you please make sure we do that? Um, so when that uh, came about, we talked with St. A's. Uh, they approached us about doing a school clinic um, and we hooked them up with Longfellow. And what they do is they provide us with services, uh, counseling services for our students and also consultation services for our students, uh, for our teachers and our administrators. And um, just like uh, uh, one of the presenters before said, um, not enough space for all of our kids to participate. 
Um, so we really want to make sure we expand that. Um, just to explain a little bit more about the program and the benefits, um, I have with me this evening uh, Dr. Larson, Principal at Longfellow, and Counselor James Bentley um, at Longfellow. And if they could uh, um, say a few words about the program and how it actually operates and the benefits of it this year, that'd be great. Yeah, you know, I'll start, although I think James can speak more to the, some of the details because he worked more intimately with uh, Ms. Fox. But um, you talk about reducing barriers for, um, you know, finding a therapist, navigating insurance, transportation. Um, you know, when you offer a service in the school, it's obviously going to be more accessible. And, um, you know, you, you try really hard not to disrupt the, the students' day-to-day -day and learning, even though they need these services. And I think Michelle Fox, who we had, was, was outstanding. Um, and somebody, and you also need to kind of build on what I think uh, Jenny had said before, how much of an asset it is for um, staff as well, just to be proactive in how they, how they work with some of our kids. I know that um, Michelle played a big role and then she attended our MLSS, our multi-level systems to support meetings. Um, so she was actually in the proactive end of, of addressing um, kids' needs, consulting with teachers and counselors together. So that was, uh, you know, even though she was there for a day, about a day and a half, um, you know, she wasn't just a passing face, if you will. She found a way to kind of immerse herself in the culture and the climate of, of Longfellow and, and really equip our, our teachers and our counselors with, with, with some strategies. Um, she was planning a um, mental health for this, a, a, a training, a staff training for mental health for the second semester, but obviously things happened and we're not there. So hopefully we'll get an opportunity for her to to pay that forward. Um, and she was also working on formalizing procedure for students needing a safety plan. I mean, she was just, she was just a valuable asset in just a short time that we had her. So, um, I mean, like I said, I think we have a very strong counseling staff as is, but she really, um, she really augmented that, that effort. So, you know, James, if you want to speak towards like caseload or, or the referral process, I think you could do that a little bit better. Sure. I just want to echo what some of the other schools said is that um, she does have a waiting list still today um, of students. Um, we started out um, by informing parents of the service that we have. And um, for the first couple months, um, we took every single parent referral. Um, we didn't even hit the second level yet of teacher referral. Um, we wanted to uh, build the capacity with our community um, and let parents know that, you know, if, if they are referring, we're taking um, their concerns seriously. So for the, for the first couple of months, all we did was um, parent referrals. And um, she has 15 students right now on her caseload uh, for a, a day and a half, which is um, a pretty hefty caseload. Um, if you know anything about the mental health services, um, she does a really good job of knowing when students can meet biweekly. Um, instead of every week, and, and hence being able to see more um, children with that. Um, she's done a great job with dealing with issues of um, anxiety, parental incarceration, depression, suicide ideation, um, reactive attachment disorder, self-interest behaviors. Um, so it's just a, such a great asset to have that whatever's thrown our way, that we have someone um, that can easily um, tackle it and be successful with it. So um, yeah, it's, it's just been an, an incredible, incredible asset to um, not only Longfellow, but to the community as whole. Um, I would, I would echo that. Um, I, I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's words here, but um, the ability to, to serve um, families that are typically underserved or who are in crisis situations has made all the difference. Um, personally, I've seen three families that um, have gone from having nowhere to turn to being able to have their students participate fully in the school setting and be in what you might describe as a, a recovery mode from some pretty traumatic things going on in their life. And so I'm just, um, I'm grateful to the district and um, I, I'm just hopeful that we can continue to expand on this because it's, it's literally um, altered lives for our children and their families. I'm so appreciative. Board have any questions for our our panelists who just um, spoke? 
I, I have one, and it was touched on a little bit, but could you give me a sense of how most of our students um, come to us? Is it mostly teachers kind of identifying um, students that might um, need these services? Is it students coming to us? Or is it uh, parents reaching out or some combination of that? I mean, what's sort of um, the breakdown of that? And I guess the second question, how much are the parents engaged in the process? Are they coming in as well, or is it um, just, just for the students at this point? Um, I can speak to what we've um, experienced at Madison. Um, it's, I would say it's probably about half and half in terms of families initiating the process and teachers initiating the process. So that's just been for us. Um, we've had um, and it, with Counseling Connections, the first meeting is actually with the family, um, with, the, with the parent, car, guardian, caregiver um, to set goals for what they want their child to be working on during those sessions. And then there are regular touch points between the therapist and the um, parents or guardians throughout the, throughout the time. Um, I've also been, um, I, I also have had families that move to um, in-home therapy along along with um, what's going on in the school just because that is what's ne what's necessitated their specific situation. Thank you. Longfellow, um, I would say that about 80% um, of the referrals come from parents. Um, and like I said, there is a waiting list and that waiting list probably um, is about 60% coming from our uh, teachers because the first wave we did was we took all parents, all parent referrals initially. Um, and just at, like at the elementary schools, parents must attend the hour to hour and a half long intake session first to set the goals and all that. Um, the one tricky thing that I think parents and and teachers sometimes have a hard time understanding is that since it's an outside mental health um, um, session and all that, the only the only time we are privy to the information is if parents sign a release form. And um, I don't know how it is at the elementary level, but the middle school level, it's about 70%. So when parents sign that, um, then the therapist um, can talk to us and the teachers specifically about that student um, but like I said, uh, we have about 30% that don't sign it. And so all that's private and, um, and we don't know too much more about that. At Madison, we've had 100% of families um, sign over consent and that's allowed us to be able to support students outside of the therapy sessions um, in their day to day. Yeah, I can add on the same thing too at Jefferson. We also have had 100% of families sign their release, especially when we explain to the family the benefit of us as educators being able to collaborate with the mental health therapist. You know, they're like, well, why wouldn't I want that for my child? Why wouldn't I want that collaboration happening around the strategies my child's learning so the teacher can help coach those strategies in the classroom or remind the child of some key words so they can access those strategies. So they're not just learning them in isolation in the therapy session in my office, but they're encouraged to transfer and apply those over the classroom setting because that's ultimately the goal of what we want. So we also have had 100% of our families um, sign off and give that permission to collaborate around the students' therapy sessions. The same is true at Underwood. And I think that integrated support is really key because um, as we're aware in a clinical setting, you're not always seeing what's going on with a student when they're interacting with their peers or interacting just in an educational setting. But that ability to have both of those um, worlds kind of merge and integrate those conversations and, and also um, our ability to respond in kind using similar language, I think has been really critical to the, the success of, of students um, being able to implement those tools to help them cope with whatever is challenging them at that time. Yeah, and I would just add on too that it's really about like the reciprocal communication. It's not just our mental health therapist collaborating with teachers and saying, here's what I'm working on. It really is reciprocal in our building where of you know, we know that our child, our children are at our school of therapy every Wednesday. So a lot of times our classroom teachers will see 
a situation or see maybe some things that are concerning about a child and they'll reach out to the therapist and say, you know, today during your session, here's some things that I'm seeing in the classroom that I just want you to know about that maybe will come up or could be integrated in that session. So that's been a really big benefit by having that waiver signed is that reciprocal conversation and collaboration between the mental health therapist and me and Hannah as our counselor and also our classroom teachers. Thank you, everyone. That was really helpful. Appreciate it. Uh, Other this is, yes, Mr. Meyer. This is Mike Meyer. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I had a question and I was on mute and that was sort of fortunate because you said some things after that. This concept of 100% participation. There aren't many things in life where a large community of families and adults will agree to a hundred, you know, a hundred percent participation. That's saying something. So my question is, and, and this isn't meant to be a silly question or a rhetorical question. This is meant to be a question of um, our strategy and priorities. Yes, these services are critical, important, um, helpful. Have it, has it risen to, to a place where you see it as transformational, that this is something we need to have and we need to have more of it. That transformational meaning, it starts to affect other things. It starts to affect um, overall health. It starts to affect achievement. It starts to improve culture, um, happiness in, in our buildings. Is, our, is this something going that you see going there where we as a community, an educational community, will have to elevate this to a, a different budgeting perspective, uh, you know, something we have to have and we have to do it right? And that's the question. Mike, I'll respond to that piece of it just because part of our discussion toward the end of this, after we talk about Children's Wisconsin, and yeah, we're, we're looking, I mean, my opinion, it's trans transformational because it's so needed for these kids. They, and, and for some of them, this may not be the answer either, but they need that help so they can learn. And we've seen the mental health concerns grow and grow, and it's not going to get this is the crisis win right now is going to make it more challenging for more kids and more families. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's going to change the way um, mental health services are, are provided to families, not just in schools, but. I mean, as a community, Wauwatosa believes that arts, performing arts are transformational, that it's something we have to have. As an adult, I've come, you know, I used to think athletics was an extracurricular. And as an adult, when I had children, I began to understand that it was transformational in a child's life. The idea that we have food programs now, that we consider that to be more than just a good thing to do, but children learn if they're better, if they're not hungry. So, I think we need to start to examine this as something that is more than important and something we do and et cetera, that it, it's part of our core culture that we do this for people. That's, that's all I have to say. Thanks. I have a question along the same lines. You know, I'm looking at, the first couple slides there where we can see the need is about 33% of our students on average need some sort of, you know, mental health care and looking at what we're proposing. Do you think we are at the, maybe the 10% level, just thinking about capacity, right? And do you think what we have in place and proposed is catching 5% of students, 10%, 33%, you know, of the need, I'm just trying to figure out what the Delta is between the need and what we have proposed, just either, you know, just considering either from budgetary restrictions or other things like how much longer or how much more 
um, do we need to come up with to really make sure that all the students that have a need um, have a place to go? Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't know if Kristen or Mark want to touch on that. I mean, my answer would be um, we're, yeah, we're not meeting, we're, we're certainly not meeting all the need. I couldn't give you a, a percentage or um, part of it is capacity of the places we're working with, including yeah. Children's Wisconsin to staff. You know, I would love to have full time people in every building right now, and uh, there's just not the people out there. There's a shortage in in that area as well. And I mean, we have a lot of people working in their district toward helping kids with mental health as well. Um, yeah, I don't know if we can get enough people as fast as we really need to, to address that growing concern. Well, I just wanna, you know, I hear about well, waiting lines and, um, you know, just the, the just the needs gonna grow. And I, and I don't feel like it's anything that's gonna diminish. And so as the treasurer and budgetarily, as we, start planning for resources and if I see we're going to spend you know of a quarter of a million dollars per year and that's one and that's 10 percent of the need right that's a little bit different planning um you know um than if we're you know we're halfway there or just something to think about you know as we and at what point do we go internal versus external you know is there a, a cost differential for us building this out internally um, versus, I mean, I know we can't bill insurance like, and they, you know, which helps subsidize, you know, um, our contractors that we're hiring for this, but just starting to think about it in a, in a macro way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can just add on in some of the conversations that I've been a part of, a lot of the discussion has been providing a quality of service over a quantity of the service. And I know just in conversations with the staff at Family Service, because we have had a waiting list and I've really wanted to grow a program, but I want to be careful not just to have any therapist come to my school because bad therapy, I'd almost have no therapy over bad therapy, mm -hmm. especially because you know, we know a lot of times that, that that first experience with a therapist really sets the tone. And if that first experience is a bad experience, we know students and families are less likely to come back. So I totally hear you. I, mm -hmm. I have a need. I would love more. But I also want to be hesitant not to rush into it because I want to deliver a quality therapy program for our students that's really going to have an impact versus saying I'm doing therapy, but it's not high quality. So it's not resulting in the change that we want to see. Thanks. Why don't we um, go into the proposal and then talk a little bit about budget and then that way if you have more questions we can answer those. So our proposal for expansion um, for next year would be to look at um, increasing in areas um, in middle, um, starting new programs um, at high school and also increasing at the elementary level. So what we'd be proposing is that the Counseling Connections Family Services Program um, add services two days a week to Eisenhower, Roosevelt, and Washington. Um, that St. A services expand to increase uh, one therapist. At, you say five days a week there, but really they could only do four and a half because they have actual meetings and billing and things like that have to take place. That have to take place, excuse me. And then we would have Children's of Wisconsin service uh, services offered at Whitman East and West, uh, one full-time therapist, five days a week. Um, I think this would be a good time for Children's Wisconsin. We have uh, Tracy Order and Ginny Miller here with us this evening to talk a little bit about the program. So I'd like to turn it over to them to explain Children's of Wisconsin. Sure, um, I'm Jenny Miller. I am the school-based uh, mental health manager for Children's Wisconsin. And Tracy does send her apologies, but she had to log off. She had a family issue to attend to. Um, it's really exciting, I have to say, to hear all of this talk and your positive response thus far to having mental health in your schools. Um, our approach at Children's Wisconsin is, is very similar. We operate on an, in, an integrative platform. Um, we're in about 50 schools across the state from the northern parts of Wisconsin down to about Racine and then uh, on the western side, Eau Claire, um, and then obviously in the southeastern side here um, by us in 11 districts. So we're in both urban and rural districts. Um, and we do do part-time and full-time programming. Um, what we're proposing is full-time programming in three of your schools this year. 
using our approach, which is um, quite similar to, to what's been discussed uh, already. Um, you know, a full-time person that fits the culture and climate of your school, um, who is available to do real-time consultation with staff, who integrates uh, family programming in as well as the individual therapy for, for students and group-based therapies. Um, somebody who, at the end of the day, um, really is seen as um, an interwoven part of the school and not necessarily seen as that, that children's person or that, you know, other providing agency person, but somebody who is seen as a, as, um, as a staff member sort of lock in step with the rest of the staff who are um, working with families to help kids achieve wellness. Um, and so historically speaking, um, we've been, in school-based mental health now for about six years and um, the program that we're proposing for um, you all is is very similar to our program in Racine where we're in currently five elementary schools and one early childhood center full-time. Um, our therapists uh, see about a 60% billable caseload and then they spend the other 40% of their time um, you know, with case notes and things like that, but then also going into classrooms, doing observations, um, meeting with um, after school groups, doing professional development, um, many, many, many other components that have been talked about about here so far. So one of, uh, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to add one of the, actually a couple of things that when we met with folks from Children's Wisconsin, I think that really stood out to me was, and it tells you about how they're looking at this program, is that number one, the idea of working with CNAs and um, family service, that was, I, I don't think we brought it up, I think they did, and said that they have absolutely no problem and think it's a good way to approach it, and we're, we're all in on that piece. The other one is there's some every school they go into and they mention that that happens, that there's some hesitancy from some of the school staff that work is being taken away and they're used to those conversations and how to, I think it's, you know, you're talking about being part of the culture of the school. So there's an acceptance issue of, of working through that piece and I really appreciate the, um, how you guys talked about your background and history and doing that and understanding that's a, that's a real issue that some people, um, some districts have, so. Mm -hmm. We definitely want to be a complimentary service um, rather than any supplanting type of service. And we work uh, with school teams to really uh, message that and, and um, create community and, um, you know, work towards everybody working together. This is a, it's proven to be a very vital piece in the schools and the communities that we're in. Um, for many of the same reasons that everybody's already spoken, you know, spoken about and spoken to. Um, and so we really try to, to message that um, really from the front end, from the planning stages. So I will, um, I'll just talk on the budget, if we can Go to that slide. So one of the, there's, there's a group through the Superintendents Association and it's called the Large District Caucus and it's the largest districts, the superintendents from the largest districts in the state. We meet four times a year. Um, recently, one of the meetings we had, we were talking about mental health and I was happened to be sitting next to the superintendent from Racine and we were having a discussion about their program. And we we're talking about the funding of it and they use their community service 80 fund and they they look to do some programming i think there was after school stuff and um but also looking looking at those as community and growing our schools into being community centers for mental health as well and finding ways to meet needs outside of the school day so our recommendation and i think it's important to point out that although the 80 fund is not 
subject to state aid, it is a direct levy. And this comes at a time when we don't know about funding. We don't know about local revenues. There's a lot up in the air and I clearly understand that. Um, but this is something I feel really strong about that we need to keep um, moving on this. And I, my, my concern is that once we get back to school, that the needs, um, the impact on kids right now is, well, I, don't, I don't know that anybody really knows the true impact on our students, but, and, and whether it rises to a mental health issue, but we know, Mike, and you mentioned, are we even close to meeting the needs? No, um, but I think the need is gonna keep growing and, and we need to keep growing in, in what we're doing, whether it's internally, but with this proposal, um, I think this is a, a huge step in the right direction. And I think it's in some ways kind of like our SRO program with the funding through the 80 fund. That's how I look at it. And I know that's how we're seeing looks at it as well. So trying to model their approach to it. And um, that's our recommendation. Well, you know, I'm gonna be the digits guy. So can you speak to um, the FTE per FTE cost of the two other vendors versus children's? Is it a much, much, much higher level of service? Is it because they're not billing the parents insurance or what's the mechanics? I just wanna understand the difference between the cost per FTE. Yeah, so the, the family service FTE, the two FTEs there, that, that was really interesting. Um, and that is a different method for us than what we're currently using with them. Right now, um, we pay them a stipend per day per school. Um, and then in, in conversations with them over the last um, week or so, as we were looking to expand and looking at the cost, um, right now we're, we're pretty locked into a specific day at a specific school. And as we talked about um, the ability to be flexible and nimble with how we are assigning staff to provide care to students, it made more sense for us financially to look at partnering with them to hire the two full-time uh, therapists to be assigned in those six schools. Um, I, I have a, a system that I use to determine um, how often um, we want to assign them, whether it's three days or two days. But um, you know, I'll use Madison as a, an example this year. Um, we weren't able to um, have as many students this year access the service early on as we had planned on. It was a little slower to start as we were getting paperwork back and connecting with families to no fault to anybody, it just, it took a little longer. But there, there was then, um, if I had the flexibility to be able to assign them to another building, which I would have um, with this hiring of two FTEs versus we're hiring someone to work at Madison, that could really work to our benefit as a school, uh, school district because we wouldn't be locked into, oh, sorry, somebody has the availability to service four more kids, but they don't have the, um, the need, for example, at that particular school right now. Um, so it, it, was, um, it was really interesting for us to be able to look at it differently and for our partnership with them and see that it could benefit more students outside of the six schools that we have um, earmarked to receive services there next year. Now at St. A's, the, uh, the middle school um, model that we're using, um, it's right now it, it seems like it's a lot less, but if you look at uh, for example, Children's is talking 60-40 split with uh, seeing students, 40% consultation, working with teachers and staff. Um, the St. A's model is really like a 90-10. So they're making the majority of their money off of billing parents. Mm -hmm. And 10% of their time, the cost for that is that $8,000 that you see there. Uh, if we were to up that to 40%, you're talking about 32, 30-some thousand dollars, we would owe them as well. So it's not, you're not comparing apples to apples really mm -hmm. there. It's a different model of billing. Um, they make their money off of the actual billing of, of, of our students. Got it. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Other questions from the board? Um, uh, good evening. Thank you, team, for the presentation. I, um, I think the things that mean a lot to me are the, uh, the way that we 
deliver the service, the way that we interact and uh, that it's, and that it's part of what we do. And it's not a stigma. We don't want this kind of service and this kind of environment to be a stigma if, if students and families need help. So that, that makes a difference to me. I think of it as a enhancement of a curriculum adoption, if you will. And, and I'm trying to figure out how best to fund it. It seems like this is, this is the best route, even if uh, we're unsure of the economic impacts coming up. It's certainly something we, we need to pursue and we need, and, and that's just uh, what we need to do. It's hard to know. I mean, I could ask questions like, well, how do we know if this is going to work and things like that. And I, I don't, I mean, we just need to enhance our programming here. And, and with this sort of model and with the vendor partner, it seems as though we want to make sure that, that the, the team is integral to our staff. So those are the things that mean a lot to me. And so I appreciate you talking through it. I don't really have a question. I just wanted to share my observations. <laughs> yeah. <Thanks. laughs> okay. Hey, this is Sean. Um, number one, just thank you for the presentation. Um, I mean, as we've all discussed in the recent months, the need for mental health services is huge. The ratios we have are not okay. And, um, you know, more needs to be done. Um, the question I have just as, uh, you know, doing our due diligence, um, you know, for the community here with the 278,000 that would come out of, you know, fund 80, which would be an additional, um, increase do we have we run the numbers to understand um, for a typical residence with an average home here what the annual uptick would be you know to cover the cost of this program on an annual basis no but i can do that and get you that yeah that would be helpful yep other requests from board members that you'd like um, answered? We, we, this is not on our agenda to vote this evening. It's a presentation um, that we would uh, look to have come back to the board for a vote in the future. Um, and so anything, this is a great time to make sure that you've, you either have your questions answered or I would say in the next few days to be in touch with Dr. Ertl about anything that you feel is kind of outstanding that you'd need to know before you felt comfortable uh, either way. Uh, having a perspective on this um yeah can you hear me very faintly very, i don't know i don't know why it's my chromebook um okay. you might want to lean closer into your device okay um <laughs> so you very well might have already answered this but um you mentioned that in elementary schools and middle schools, the way the programs worked is you needed a teacher referral or a parent referral in order to, to seek treatment. But for high schoolers especially, it seems like high schoolers' mental health might not necessarily be a conversation having with their parents. So do the high school or really any of the students need that refer referral in order to get treatment or can they go and say I need to talk to someone on their own does that make sense I don't know if that made sense Mr. Carter do you know if that can be a self-referral John, I do not know that. Ginny, have you guys had any experience with that, self-referrals from students? We do. Um, in, in the high school programs that we're in, um, there are several um, high school students who refer themselves. We do, um, we do accept 
student referrals, there is some communication that does need to go on with parents because of insurance issues and things like that. Um, but um, some of our some of our our um, most successful cases are, are student led and student referred cases. Uh, what we do do um, on, in our high school programs is very similar to the middle school and the elementary school programs where we're working with the student support teams in the building. Um, and of course, anybody can choose to sign a release or choose not to sign a release of information to share information between the school and the therapist. Um, and even to control within that release of information what could get shared or what doesn't get shared. Um, but uh, most of our, our high school students um, end up actually signing the release of information because it does become a little bit helpful down the road for them to, um, you know, be able to share some of their information with schools and um, school counselors and things like that. It's totally their, their choice. Um, some don't, um, but we do definitely get a lot of self-referrals. there has to be some information shared with parents because of the billing, correct? Correct. Yep. And we're very transparent about that. When somebody refers, either a parent refers, a child, a teacher refers, a, you know, whomever it is, um, a, a young person refers themselves. Um, we had that conversation up front about, you know, some of our limits and, and what we can and, and cannot do, you know, um, in the guise of confidentiality. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any final last questions or comments from the board? I think the only other, this is Sean again. The only other last comment I've got, I guess, is depending on the impact that it'll have on you know, local residents, I just think we should, to maybe Mr. Phillips's point, um, maybe he was going in a different direction with it. Just to think about this in the scope of the overall you know, plan and budget and the impact on people. This is a tough time for people. Um, and, you know, if we're going to go um, in one direction in one part, I think we should like really have a tough conversation about like what are the things um, that can be offset in some way. Um, it's just a difficult time for people. And I think we should just be cognizant of the fact that adding another thing um, will be difficult for people to accept, even if it's for the most legitimate of causes that there is. And my, you know, uh, yeah, my kids already benefit from the services that exist already, which is wonderful. But I just think that we've got to really be mindful of what we're we're asking people to put forward here. So if we can have that comprehensive conversation on the entire budget as we have this conversation, I think that'd be good to represent to the community. Well said, Sean. Any community comment on this item? There's none. No one raised hands. Okay. Um, Thank you all very much for your time and attention. Um, lots of work clearly going into this topic um, and look forward to, to hearing more and kind of getting some of the questions that were laid out tonight uh, that may need some additional information shared. That information shared. And we'll talk more on this topic as we move forward. Um, next up is a superintendent report, the East Field naming rights. So I will start this out. So we have, since Eastfield was actually before it was even completed, um, there was kind of an organic process that, or, or naming thought uh, on naming that field. Since that time, we've created a policy that allows that to happen. Um, I know Mr. Rowland had made a formal request to have this considered to be named um, the Schrader Memorial Field. So I had contacted Mr. Hughes and Eric Dale. Eric is the one of the soccer coaches at East and also a teacher there. 
but also um, when the field was dedicated, you know, he gave a, a, a speech and, inv and in, in related to um, Scott Schrader, which I thought was really, really well done and well stated. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that and let Mr. Hughes and Mr. Dale talk about the proposal that they have. Sure, I'm going to let Mr. Dale really lead a little bit. He was a, a classmate of Scott Schrader's and when we did dedicate the field, uh, asked about possibly naming it after uh, a classmate. Uh, there was a memorial uh, where the pool project is going on. Uh, there was a tree that was planted uh, when Scott passed away, as well as a small uh, commemorative marker, both which we have saved. We've cut and saved the majority of that tree uh, in hopes of doing something with it and save the marker. Uh, but Mr. Dale, uh, I asked him to put together just sort of a, a little background about uh, Scott and why we feel it would be appropriate to name that field uh, in his honor. Thanks, boss. Um, thanks for being patient and sticking around for this, people. I appreciate it. Um, it's a long haul through these meetings sometimes. So um, I'm going to be real quick. And this, I'm about to commit a cardinal sin. Um, I always tell my, my, my students that whenever you present something or you have something to show on a slide, don't read it. Well, tough. I'm going to read it. I prepared this about a week ago, and no, please, if you see any students walking the streets, don't tell them I did this, okay? So I'm just going to read this letter to you. I'm going to share it on the screen. Give me one second here. And there we go. Just give me a quick holler if you can see it, everybody. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Wauwatosa School Board members, it's with great appreciation that I come forward as both a proud Wauwatosa East High School graduate and current teacher to propose that the North Athletic Complex Plex at East High School be named Scott A. Schrader Memorial Field. I had the honor of playing varsity soccer at East with Scott during what would have been my junior year, the fall of 88. As a teammate, I cannot think of a player on that season's team who was more dedicated or passionate than Scott. Uh, that was my first season of playing varsity soccer at East, and Scotty was someone who made everyone feel valued, appreciated, and loved. His enthusiasm was contagious, and when the toil of a grueling or difficult training session became overwhelming, his teammates could always rely on him to push themselves to work harder. What's more, he had the extraordinary ability to make people laugh and remind them to remind them that the true joy of athletics was to enjoy both hardships and successes together as a family. He was committed to this family, his friends, and his school. Scott would always put in more time on his game than any player on our team. Once training was over for the afternoon, Scott would stay on the practice field at East long after we all had left. He'd spend hours at East during the preseason striking free kicks from all angles, making him one of our team's most dangerous dead ball strikers. Oftentimes, those extra individual practice sessions would see him on the field until the last shred of sunshine went down. I can picture him to this day as a dim figure on the field at East late into the evening, lining up shots from distance with several soccer balls spread all over the penalty box. He put in the work, the time, and the patience to make himself better, serving as a role model and mentor to all of us who had the privilege to play with him. And this is probably... I, I think even a stronger case for the field being named after Scott. In January of 1991, during Desert Storm, all of us who knew him were shocked to discover that Scotty was one of the first American casualties serving in the war. At the delicate age of 20, Scott's life came to a tragic end. His commitment to serve as a U.S. Marine and to pay the ultimate price in protecting his country made Scott a hero. I proposed that all the wonderful traits that Scott embodied, the example he set for his family and friends, and the legacy and impact he left on everyone at Tosa East make him a deserving candidate for naming rights to our beautiful new field and athletic complex. I know, he'd be, I know he would be proud to receive this honor, and I feel it's our duty to honor his memory for all that he accomplished in his short but incredible life. Respectfully, Eric Dale. So, there you go. Um, I guess if anyone has any questions, I, I, it, it's, a, it's something that's been in the minds of me and many of my teammates and classmates uh, go f go to the board, go to Mr. Hughes, Dr. Dr. Earl with his plan. So does anyone have any questions or anything I could answer about Scott? What I would say is that Eric did reach out to uh, one of his brothers as well as his parents who are still in Wauwatosa to talk about, first of all, to get their, their permission, essentially. Um, it would be inappropriate to name a field after someone if the parents uh, surviving family members didn't feel it was appropriate. So that was a step that Eric took also uh, before even bringing this written proposal forward. Okay. 
I think it's a beautiful proposal. I mean, I just... I had one of my AP students write it, so... That was a joke, but okay. I'm gonna well well on mute. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, how do we move forward? I, and how do we include the family? And you know, what do we do next? Nick, you want to speak to that? Well, I think you know. Obviously, we're bringing this as uh, as just sort of a, a topic for discussion. I think it would require some board vote at the next meeting. I have started uh, on Dr. Erdl's request just to look at some commemorative plaques or some ideas as to how it might commemorate, uh, whether it was some signage on the scoreboards, but I think more importantly, uh, some sort of dedication plaque that could be right outside the main entrance to the field, looking at some of those newly grassed areas. Uh, I talked to Melissa Nettishine Buildings and Grounds to make sure that uh, it is both tasteful and functional for that area, uh, but there's a lot of examples out there about dedication plaques uh, who search uh, on the internet. Uh, there's not a lot of cost and prices that they put out there until you tell them exactly what you want. Uh, but there's a lot of unique markers, I think, that could be uh, created to honor Scott uh, and explain the significance of why those fields would be named after him. Okay. So I have a question, and it's less about Scott because he's obviously obviously a very deserving uh, candidate for to receive this honor. And if I'm not mistaken, there's actually a, a, a plaque and a tree at Jefferson um, that is named after him that I've talked to my kids about through the years. Um, I think it's a, a broader question for the board. I know when we created the policy, um, I know at the time I was thinking specifically about like how it related to donations and, and things like that. I do wonder um, when we're naming it for a person, if this will set precedent for um, naming other things and if there needs to be a process in place by which we respond. So the way this was framed to me, and I think the, the reason it, it hit me like this is that it said a proposal. And it's not like we put out a request for proposals. This was like a, a proactive proposal, which is wonderful. I mean, Eric, you had me in tears at the dedication. Um, and I support this, uh, just to be clear. Um, I just think we might want to think about how do we make sure we do this so that we don't find ourselves in a pickle years from now where they say when we don't want to respond in, in naming something, um, and then say, well, there was no request for proposals the first time, like why yes to this and no to that. Um, and I'm just sort of curious if anybody else had thought about that. So less about the actual proposal on the table and more about do we actually want to ensure that there's a process or is the policy a process enough? And I don't know if we have to talk about this in this moment, but if we wanna come back in two weeks from now, I think we should probably get on the same page. Any, yeah, I don't, um, I, I might suggest that, that we think about that and talk about that in two weeks, uh, unless the board has kind of any immediate thoughts that they'd wanna share. I think my only immediate thought, and it's kind of about the process a little bit too, as I was thinking about that, is, and maybe we've looked into this, but um, is is Scott the only one that we know of that is a TOSA student that may have given their life and, you know, in defense of the country? Are we, and I'm just thinking out loud, are, are we studying other students that may have served in some capacity? Is it maybe better to do as a as a group for all, you know, former TOSA students that have, you know, served and possibly, you know, given their life. I don't know the answer to those questions, but I don't want to, Scott sounds like an amazing person and, and um, certainly the right person to honor. Are there others too that would be better to do as, as a group setting, I guess is, is my thought. Um, and I don't know what that answer is. And maybe that's already been researched and, and thought about. Um, I just don't want to slight others um, in the process as well, because there might have been 
many people who sacrificed and other families that might feel slighted, um, you know, if their if their loved one wasn't included. If I could just say one thing, sorry, everybody. Um, I think both valid points were made there by um, Mr. Mr. Doman and Leah. Um, I, I think it goes beyond just him being a veteran of war, a casualty of war. I think the other part that I remember is just the family is, it's a Toast East family. And I, you know, we have many families that have gone through the doors and, and he was such an integral part of our team, a leader, a vocal leader, um, a guy who put in the work after the words. And I, the fact that we went to a long length to build this field and get it to happen. I also, there was nobody who spent more time on that field than Scott, uh, an ideal teammate, a, a, a captain, uh, a guy everyone looked up to. So I, I also look at that being just as appealing. And I, I don't, I don't I'm not trying to push veterans of war away uh, for having rights to the field too. That makes total sense. But I, he was, so, he was, he was a legend in our high school uh, just for the values of being a good teammate and a terrific student athlete, uh, a, a mentor. Okay. This is Sean. Um, so I've known about this proposal for what feels like maybe a year, maybe, maybe a little bit less. Probably longer. Um, yeah, right. At least I've been aware of it for a while. So when we were talking through the naming policy, that was really what originated the need for the naming policy in my mind and what was, uh, you know, to this group, I kind of said, we should tap the brakes here because we don't have a naming policy in place. And to the exact point, um, to your point, Ms. Fraley and Mr. Doman, um, is to have a policy in place so we have some rationale for, or we have some calculus as to why we would name something and we wouldn't name something else, or we do have a process for um, allowing for naming applications to come in. So to me, I've always thought about this with this proposal in mind and other subsequent proposals to come. So to me, I feel comfortable with it and based on the conversation, but if others don't feel comfortable with it, then I think it does make conversation it does make sense for us to an agenda conversation about, or just to take a look at that policy again to say, do we still feel good about this? Others want to chime in on preference for next steps or else Dr. Earl and I can sit down and put our, put our heads together. Uh, yeah. Mike Meyer here. Uh, if, this is the choice, then I ask that it be considered and the um, appropriate officials be contacted that there be um, a military honor guard present for the dedication. Considering the circumstances of the um, what happened in the war and that sacrifice that I think that would be appropriate have some formal honor guard presence at, at the ceremony if it comes to pass that this is the choice. I just wanted to add that uh, prior history, uh, I'm not sure how formal the process has been, um, but we have Dale Brightlow, Tom Steiner, Lois Weber, they all have dedications in their name and I don't recall that those kinds of things came to the board in a I'm not sure that they came to the board in a very formal way um, so they're incredible people in our district and we're trying to recognize um, recognize people in many different ways I think this is just one way that we do that we do recognize people Do we have any other examples of honoring students or were all the folks that were just listed administrators or staff? Because I think that's really helpful historical context, Sharon. I'm just curious specific to students if there's any examples. 
I, I they don't come to scholarships come named to, after. Yeah, yeah I mean they they don't come to my mind in that way, but scholarships and yeah, probably Mr. Hughes could. Lisa Mickey. Yeah. But they, yeah, I think primarily the ones that I associate with students would be uh, local scholarships. Um, given, uh, like you mentioned, the Mickey Scholarship, uh, as well as uh, Sarah, whose last name escapes me, uh, who passed away as well. So there are some local scholarships in honor of um, families. Um, I don't know if this is relevant, but I know, I don't know if Roosevelt still has them, but Roosevelt used to have benches in the playgrounds on both the north and south side um, to honor one of my classmates when I was in first grade who died of leukemia. So that is an example of a time when we have dedicated a physical thing to a student. So. Yep, those are still there. So I would, I would add another comment just to be helpful to the gist of the, you know, how do we do this conversation? Um, if there are, you know, all of us could come up with names and I guess that's the problem or the challenge that, you know, what name would you pick? Um, this is a little puts us on the spot because one name was presented and there wasn't maybe I'm misunderstanding this like a, a sanctioned committee or whatever. I don't know. So on the other hand, it seems that sometimes and I'm not, appropriately so that when there's a, a loss of someone that there's an immediate desire to name something for them appropriately to honor them. In this case, the loss was, you know, a long time ago. So the sentiment has um, had durability. You know, it's, it's been a sentiment that's longstanding, evidently. And I think that's something that should be considered in this case and something that should be considered in the general case, that this is not a, um, a recent observation of a need to honor someone. This is something that, that has, has stood a, a test of time before it's come to us. That's all I have to say. So based on what I'm hearing, um, we see great value uh, in honoring um, in honoring an alum who gave his life, um, cared deeply about that specific space, um, and spent a lot of time on those fields. Um, we are not voting on that. We are not agenda to vote on this this evening. Uh, there's a few board questions, I think more broadly about others that may be uh, both worthy of being honored. What's our process for uh, understanding who those individuals are. And then um, the question ultimately is, uh, when do we agenda kind of our next steps uh, to consider this specific decision? Um, what I would say is, uh, what I'd like to do is to kind of take this back with Dr. Ertl, talk through that, have Dr. Ertl send out uh, some information in a memo, uh, have board members kind of sit with this a little bit, uh, see if they have any other questions. What I'm hearing is that universally, there's value for honoring um, honoring Scotty in this context. And then I think the, how do we, how do we do that? And how does that interface with other areas where we may want to also honor others? Um, so I think that'll be important. Um, so any other questions from, from the board or anything from uh, Mr. Hughes or Mr. Dale? Dr. Ertl, does that sound okay as kind of next steps to you? Sounds good. And I just wanted to say thank you to Mr. Dale and Mr. Hughes for working on this and putting it together. I want to thank Mr. Dale because he's done all the work. Thank you, Mr. Dale. Thanks for hearing me out, everybody. Right. I heard a rumor it was actually an AP student, so it's not clear to me. 
Impossible. Their work would have been a little better. You were that eloquent, Dr. Jessup. Maybe if Eva wrote it, we'd be great. We're getting she there. Can do we're it. getting there. Eva, she's yeah. Eva actually wrote the. She was the board plant. Well done. I was me. I just keep quiet about it, but. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Um. Our last item on the agenda is our school board officer and board secretary elections. Um, Dr. Earl, um, I'm going to turn it over to you as, uh, is there a question? I said, all right. Oh, um, I thought I heard Sean's voice somewhere in the background. Um, And so I will go with the, I believe we're, we start with the elections and then we ultimately move to uh, install folks uh, through a normal kind of uh, our, our process. Um, so Dr. Ertl is gonna lead us through this process and he's gonna send out emails. A key reminder here, and Dr. Ertl will probably say this three or four times, Make sure you're, re you're replying to his emails, not replying all to his emails. Um, so double check that before we, before we go. Dr. Ertl? Line copy email, so I'm protecting you. So even if you do reply all, it only goes to me. So according to school board policy 0150, school board officers will be nominated and elected in the following order, president, vice president, treasurer, and clerk. We do not have paper ballots. We will be doing this through email. I have sent, uh, previously sent out eight emails to all the school board members. Per board policy, the president and vice president are not eligible for more than two consecutive one-year terms. Um, so we should be good because both of our vice president and president have served one-year terms and are both eligible for continuing. Um, the first vote is the nomination. And I'm going to beg for patience as I work through these emails. So the first vote is a nomination for president. If you would type in the name of one person and as I open them, I will read them off as I tally them, but will not read more than one at a time. That's not I will not repeat a name if it's once you've been nominated, that's the only one that goes on there. First one is Dr. Jessup Anger. Okay, the next will be the vote for president and there's only one nomination for president and that would be Dr. Joseph Anger. We still do need to do the vote. And the vote is, first one is Dr. Jessup Anger. 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 And the last vote is Dr. Jessup Anger. So Dr. Jessup Anger will be recommended for president. 
Congratulations. Thank you all for the vote of confidence. I appreciate it. Next up, nomination for vice president. First nomination is Mr. Doman. Mr. Rowland. Ms. Neufeld. Ms. Fraley. So the next vote. I would, Dr. Riddle, I would yes. like to politely decline my nomination. All right, Mr. Rowland has declined his nomination. So the three people nominated for vice president, Mr. Doman, Ms. Fraley, and Ms. Milfeld. So if you can send your vote in for one of those three. Still waiting for one. Okay. The vote for Vice President, Mrs. Mielfeld. Mrs. Fraley. Mrs. Fraley. Mr. Doman. Mrs. Fraley. Mrs. Fraley. Mr. Doman. So with with four votes, Mrs. Fraley will be recommended for vice president. Congrats. Next up, nomination for treasurer. Nominations for treasurer, Mr. Phillips. Would Mike Digit Phillips be the same? All right. Little levy, sorry. 
We don't want that guy. <laughs> All right. Looks like the vote is for uh, one nominated candidate, Mr. <laughs> Mike Phillips. So please vote for treasurer. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips, Mr. Phillips, and uh, we're waiting for one more. Mr. Phillips. So recommended for a treasurer will be Mr. Phillips. Next up, nomination for clerk. Nominated for clerk, Mr. Doman. Mrs. Neufeld. All right, nominated for clerk, Mr. Doman and Mrs. Mufeld. So now your vote for clerk. All right, vote for clerk. Mr. Doman. Mr. Doman. Mr. Doman. Mrs. Milfeld. Mr. Doman, Mrs. Muefeld, and Mrs. Muefeld. With four votes, Mr. Doman will be recommended for clerk. So for the four positions, Dr. Jessup Anger for president, uh, Mrs. Fraley for Vice President, Mr. Phillips for Treasurer, and Mr. Doman for Clerk. Mr. Rollins. Yes. Can you read this out? Do you see the uh, executive content on this one?
I see. Okay. <clears throat> it is recommended that the following persons be elected officers of the Wauwatosa School Board in accordance with policy number 0150 for a term beginning tonight and ending May 2021. President, Dr. Eric Jessup Anger, Vice President, um, Leanne Braley, Treasurer, Mike Phillips, Clerk, Steve Doman. And it is recommended that the superintendent be appointed to act as secretary to the board. And I so move. Second. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Ms. Newman, can you call the roll? Mr. Doman? Yes. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Mufeld? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Rollin? Yes. Dr. Jessup Anger? Yes. Thank you and congratulations to everyone on um, being willing to serve in these roles uh, and for your capacity, knowledge, wisdom, and guiding us through the next year. Um, I appreciate all six of you in, in, in an incredible amount and I'm uh, glad that we're here together um, in these roles for Wauwatosa right now. Um, any public comment on any non-agenda items to wrap up for the evening? Seeing none, May I have a motion to adjourn at 9.55 p.m.? So moved. Thank you, Sean. Second. second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Mufeld. Uh, Ms. Newman, please call the roll. Mr. Doman? Yes. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Mufeld? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Rollin? Yes. Dr. Jessup Anger? Yes, and we are adjourned. We will see all of your bright, shiny faces virtually uh, two weeks from tonight. Same bat channel, same bat location. Okay. Unless sooner. And may the fourth be with you. <laughs>